Cole is dead. Rest in peace. We have a loaded episode for you today. Uh, this is a Wednesday episode for Baseball's Dead. Normally, this is the midweek episode. It's usually not that long. Uh, this th- A lot has happened since the last time that we have gotten together. There's a lot of major news, a lot of things that happened on the field, off the field, the whole nine yards. We got an interview with Carl Ravitch. Very important uh, discussion that we're having here today that centers around Sarah Langs. If you haven't heard, you're about to find out. Uh, Dallas has but brief moments with us today because his Pittsburgh Pirates have to play the Oakland A's. and He has to catch a bus to go see uh, his Pirates take on the Oakland Athletics later. Um, so, all right, let's let's fucking get right to it. Let's just uh, we're playing like a what's that called in football when they like hurry down the field? Two minute drill. If that's what it's hurry called. Up uh, offense. Yeah. Hurry up off. Thank you, Jay. Hey, that's that's football, what I was going for. Guy. Yeah, big time football guy. Oh, this is a perfect place to start. The baseball is dead parlay finally hit. Plus eight something, 846, something like that odds. A lot a lot of wealth distributed. Wow. A lot yeah. of people you- <laughs> out there winning a lot of money on the DraftKings Sportsbook because the baseball is dead parlay hit on monday i feel like that's we're gonna hit a decent amount like i said before like when i put out my parlays it's like it's almost like a power ranking it's like your first pick is the one that you feel the strongest about and then you kind of like yeah I, I think that might hit and like this could hit but if you have four baseball Jeez. minds with with the pick that they feel the, the strongest about combining together that parlay i mean it's probably gonna hit a, a I don't want to say more often than not, but a decent amount, a respectable amount. Mm. And that was reflected. I don't know. I was was told that I was an idiot. I got everything wrong. So I don't know how that makes sense. That doesn't really happen (laughs) to me. But if you say so. I mean, you're batting like, you're you're, you're like 50% right now. It's pretty good. I think I've missed once. Beast. Yeah. Um, But anyways. Um... I, I, there's a lot of things that happened that could be the lead story today, which is crazy I, because it's only been fucking 48 I, hours. Has to be Degrom, right? Well, um, I w- I would say Degrom, Jared, but I, I do I only have brief moments. I, I do want to say this: I owe something to Blue Jays fans. I owe an apology to Blue Jays fans. <laughs> um, I am going, I am going to check the Blue Jays off as a team that I will no longer identify as having a pitcher that I think could potentially win the Cy Young Award. All right. Mm -hmm. I've been told by many Blue Jays fans that I broke Barrios by by looking for him to win the Cy Young Award. They say, we're just now getting him back to sea level, Dallas. Can you stay the fuck out of our pitching rotation and keep them away from any award you think they're going to win? So Alec Manoa, who has now found himself at the minor league complex, and I know initially the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, my God, demotion to the minor leagues that is not what this is that is what this is all at the same time what you need to remind yourself of is the controllability having the ability to control the environment it's like when you get in your car and you want it to be 69 on your side and your passenger wants it to be 74 on theirs climate control that's what the facility back in Florida allows the staff to do is control the climate of the outings for Alec Manoa. And now you have a ton, a ton of resources, whether it's coaching staff, technological, that will allow him to identify the the hiccups, identify the shortcomings, and help him get better. That's hard to do at double A some random town in wherever that is. You know, like so when you're at the facility where all of the resources and all of the technology and the staff is available to you to the extent that it is, this is the best place for Alec Manoa to be right now. So it's not a demotion all the way to rookie ball. It's a matter of being in the best place to make sure that all of the necessary adjustments are made and paid attention to. I mean, I also picked Alec Manoa. Um, <laughs> so yes, you it did. is... Uh, and- Well, it's not been good. Right now, the hard contact rate, higher than it's ever been, 35.3%. All right, what does that mean? 
I think it stands to reason that the soft and the medium contact, those numbers would probably near the lowest that they have ever been. And that is true. He's getting a lot less swings on pitches outside of the strike zone. Chase rate down. Contact in the zone, up. So they're not chasing. When they do decide to go out of the zone, they're making more contact with those pitches than they ever have. And when they do decide to offer at strikes, they're hitting those more than they ever have. So well, things what are is, just what not, does all that mean? Why is this happening? Like I think deception I think stuff, finish on the pitches that can come from a mechanical hiccup where, all right, maybe I'm just not, maybe my hand position is just slightly off the, 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 is it, spin pitch, or is it pitch clock related? Cause that's basically what everyone's asking. Is it pitch clock related? Yes. I, I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I can't sit here and tell you that, Alec Manoa is down at the minor league complex right now because he can't figure out how to operate under the pitch clock. I, 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 I can't say that. I don't. I, honestly, I don't want to say that because if that's the case, we got problems. Well, don't you think that there's a big difference between getting option to Triple A and getting option to the fucking rookie ball? No, no, no. Like, like for for all of the reasons I just told you right now. Because they, they, if, if they think it's more than just dealing with the pitch clock, they're going to figure out a way to, to have him adjust if his stuff is still competitive. Right now, it's not competitive. And so they understand that there's probably a bigger fish to fry here. So we need to go hook that fish, pull him out of the pond, take him back down to Dunedin or wherever the hell they're at, and figure that out. Yeah. I mean... It's it, it had gotten so bad to where he goes up against the Houston Astros and was only able to record one out, um, allowed six Ernie's in the first, was only able to get one out. And I don't know. I wasn't watching the game, so I don't know who that one out is. But I <laughs> bet you he feels like a piece of shit. <laughs> that's a that's a was a tough cross to bear being the one guy that Alec Manoa was able to get out. But no, it sucks. I mean, I think um, uh, I. It's been bad all year. I don't think that it's something that has spiraled out of control progressively. I don't think he ever got out of the gate, really. He had that one start in the Bronx where he went up against Garrett Cole and he looked like the Alec Manoa of old. And that was just kind of coming up for air. And the rest has been brutal. I'm I'm not going to say that, like, obviously, it's spun completely out of control this season, but mostly with the benefit of hindsight. There are there were some warning signs that I think looked more serious than we gave credence from going from 21 to 22 and some of his stats there, like the decline in his strikeout rate, the decline in his whiff rate, like his slider, which had been a signature pitch, a really important pitch for him in his rookie season has gotten increasingly less effective, both in terms of like batted ball result and ability to generate swings and misses like I I I. This is like I saw a comparison to Roy Halladay, right? Who I, I think that's the convenient well, there you go comparison because same franchise also mm-hmm. got sent all the way back down to single you know, minor league complex or whatever whatever it was at the time. Yeah. Um, but like it, that was as I understand it to work with a very specific pitching instructor, or pitching coach Mel Queen, and I don't know like. I, we don't know. I don't think anybody on this podcast knows whether the plan for Manoa is that specific or whether it's just like kind of a reset. But in the in the way that you can earn a six run ERA, he kind of did earn it this year. This isn't like a statistical fluke. This is things need to improve, like pitch quality. He's lost velocity on his fastball, and I think I saw Kyle Bodie note that, uh, and and I will trust his judgment on this that he lost like a little bit over a mile an hour at the most crucial juncture at which you cannot lose a mile an hour on your fastball, like that 92 to 93 kind of area, uh, because statistically you lose a lot of effectiveness if you drop down below that. So there's a lot Deception. going on here. And yeah. And like Deception. as Dallas said, not throwing the ball in the strike zone, like it's the third largest year over year increase in walk rate in all yeah. of baseball this year. Only Keller and Bumgarner who got fucking released are ahead of him. So like a, a lot of concern that I think is really legitimate and hope he, hopefully he gets back. What in, what in your mind, Jay Hay, um, is the crux of the issue? I, 
I think his pitches are just fundamentally less effective than they were. And I don't know enough about like pitching beyond that to know why that's happening. I don't know if that's like a mechanics issue or a conditioning issue or uh, like a, 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 a plane issue. Like, I don't, I don't know, but it's, well, that's, that's where all the of fastball. That. Yeah. It's both the fastball and the slider. And to me, that says that like something is fundamentally broken. That's not just a small tweak. Yeah. And this is where you have to spend time in the lab over and over and over again to try to figure this out. What's wrong? Let's throw a bullpen. Let's throw a side. Let's assess. Maybe we're throwing live BP and we're assessing that as well. Now you got to rest so you can get on the mound and do it again a few days from now. Well, a big league schedule doesn't afford you that. A minor league complex schedule absolutely affords you the opportunity to do that as well as, again, the resources. So the edutronic, you know, all of these things. Those are the things that you're going to have to utilize to figure out what the fuck is going on. So I understand the move. I get the move. It makes sense. I just hope that they're able to find something and he's able to get back to and recapture some of the competitive stuff because when the dude is on, the dude is fucking money. Uh, Two-part question. Um, Are we commending the Blue Jays for doing this uh, at a time? Like, was the time appropriate? Like, had we seen enough? Is this is it too late? Uh, the timing, I guess, on all this, because I, I, after after he got pulled from that start against the Astros, I saw a lot of reaction on Twitter being like, they've got to option him, like they've got to send him down. And seeing that, I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to. I mean, like the, the Blue Jays right now, they need him. They have not performed to expectations. He's been a big part of that. Um, and I guess the second part of the question is specifically for Dallas when something like this happens and like when, when a guy gets sent down to triple a for poor performance, he's not part of that discussion. You get sent down to the minor league complex. He's involved in that discussion. No, like, are, are they just telling him like you're going back down to the bottom or is it something where it's like, where would you feel more comfortable to do a full reset? Because that's what we need to do. You can probably ask him, and I'm sure that that was something that they asked, but it's really just to gauge his comfort level because from there, he is your commodity and you will have him do what you feel is best for him, but there needs to be a marriage between his desire to do that and your desire to have him do those things. So much like we have to do with folks who might be a little tough to convince at times, you have to kind of make it their idea. And so I think it's easily done in this instance where you say, look, we know you want to compete. We know how much you hate the fact that this is happening. We feel like being able to put you in the most controlled environment possible is the best way for you to get back on track. We don't feel like sticking you in double A AA or triple A somewhere, maybe without all those resources and eyeballs on you and the ability to control your outings is the best for you because we know you're just going to revert back to being the competitor that you are. And that's why we love you, dude. But this is why we also probably have to pull you back a little farther to get you away from that mindset and get you back into the let's figure this out what's wrong type of mindset. Because at the end of the day, as athletes, we go out there and we try to survive when it's game time. We will do whatever we have to do to survive when it's game time. To hell with getting better. To hell with figuring out what's wrong. I need to dot this fucking one-two slide piece so I can get out of this jam. And you're going, buddy, it's fucking, it's double A. You're Alec Manoa. We're just looking to get you better here. And he's going, fuck you. There's outs. It's game time. So you got to pull the athlete out of that arena and put them in one that's more conducive to growth. Mm. Also, like, just, I, I know the start against the Astros was bad, but there was no evidence leading up to that that he had turned a corner. It wasn't like he'd been making progress and then that was just a big step back that maybe you could overlook. The entire month of May was a disaster. He had a 6.15 ERA, a 6.85 FIP, and really more to the point, <clears throat> here are his pitch totals and innings pitched in the start leading up to that Astro start. Five innings pitched, 100 pitches. Five innings pitched, 103 pitches. Four and two thirds, 94 pitches. Four innings, 92 pitches. Five and two thirds, 85. Three innings pitched, 87 pitches. Four innings pitched, 89 pitches. Like, that's Laborious. not a guy that has figured anything out. No. Looking at the, which is 
both box score reading and let's be honest, anybody who watched any of those starts would have come to the same conclusion with their eyes, right? So this to me is like, if anything, it was, it definitely wasn't early. I don't think. Um, I think this felt like the appropriate time. Like that was the start that made clear this is the direction we're heading. Things need to change. Mm. Joseph, any thoughts? It's tough. Yeah, he got worse in pretty much every category. And we'll see what happens, man. I don't know how you cure it. But I got high hopes. He's been a a beast before you could be a beast again. So, And how old is he? He's 25. He's like 26. 25 years old. They said on the Blue Jays broadcast that he was like kind of pissed. They sent him down. It seemed like it was an intense conversation. He still has the well, yeah. competitive fire. Sure. I mean, he's he's one of those guys. That I, I brought it up in the interview with Tyler Glasnow because um, I forget how we got on the subject, but we were talking about guys that are just like, you know, loud mouth assholes on the mound, but like nice guys away from it. And I was like, you can say his name. It's Alec Manoa. I was like, that that's a guy that's like a bulldog on the mound. And he's like talking a lot of shit. And but like I've talked to him walking down the street in street clothes and he couldn't have been nicer. So I I can't imagine the conversation that uh, you're being sent all the way down <laughs> to the first floor. Uh, I can't imagine him taking that great unless unless you're um, the the only way that that conversation goes smoothly is if you yourself have accepted that hey like I need to correct this if well, if you in your mind think I'm getting close like I know the results don't dictate that but my next time out I really think I can take a step forward and then you kind of just you're out of chances then yeah because there's got to be a level of embarrassment um there were some people not gonna name names or anything but some people before the season even started suggested that the pitch clock would not uh work in the favor of an alec manoa because of his body type which i don't i don't think i don't know and until he comes out and says that it had some sort of effect, it's I don't I don't know that you can just directly make that correlation. But the timing you, of it on, is come on. Do you think just let's be real here, Alec Manoa being a cool dude aside? Do you think anybody that has staunchly defended themselves, especially in that specific arena, would ever then come out and go, you know what, <clears throat> hand up? I I was that was me. I was defending. The fact that I was out of shape and I shouldn't have, I was out of shape. And I don't this think you is have what, to like say I'm out of shape, but you can say that the pitch clock made a difference. <laughs> but I mean, you, well, you might as well say <laughs> that I'm because well, that, those then are the two different up, Jared, statements. Oh, no, yeah, no, those because are two the di- follow yes, up. Are. No, no, they're they're the exact same because the follow up well, question can, is: does, you can does interpret anybody want to ask it? But it's two does different anybody, things to say. The pitch clock well, no, affected my performance versus. I'm out okay, of shape. Well, let's let's try this. How did it affect your performance? No comment. <laughs> okay, there you go. And there you go. And that's why it's exactly the same as saying that I was out of shape. And I that's get why that that's how it would be it. interpreted, but you, there are ways to say well, it. There's no saying. other. There's just no other way to interpret that. Uh, I don't know. You know, I found myself out there really thinking about things a lot longer because I didn't have as much time as I had before. That's what happened, really. Uh, no. And that's why. And so, I, I, again, not my words. I'm not, I didn't believe I just told you, I don't think the pitch clock has anything to do with it. And I would really hate to think that that was the case because if you can't make that kind of simple adjustment at some point in time, then, then you have now turned it into a crutch and it's become a hurdle that apparently you can't clear mentally to hell with what shit looks like for you physically. If, if that's a problem to the point where you can't figure out so how to think, adjust, you think he's out of shape. That's what you're saying. <laughs> uh, not even close. That's kind of what you're saying there. Nope, not at all. You're saying that it's it's a physical issue, which can only mean no, one. I mean, it no, I said bad it's knees, not, a, not a physical issue. Mm. I would hate to think that it's that big of a hurdle for him to have to mm. clear mentally. So you're saying that he couldn't jump over a hurdle is what you're saying. <laughs> that is that is not what I'm saying. Yeah, that's kind of what you said. Nope. <laughs> I you better hope to God he doesn't fucking hear this because he's huge. <laughs> he is wow. a big man. 
Wow. Well, I mean, you just, I'll let, I'll let those words resonate. I mean, he's what? Six, four, six, five. Hey, he's you're, six, you're, six, you're, dude. He's six, six. I stood next to this man. If you can tower over me, you're fucking, you're a monster. <laughs> my, it's my grandma said. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no comment. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Hey, buddy. It's cocked and loaded. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, speaking about dish and meat, uh, yeah. Omaha Steaks. For a limited time, when you go to omahasteaks.com and enter the promo code DEAD, D E A D, into the search bar, you'll be able to order the dad's favorite gift package for just $99.99. Plus, You'll get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers with your order. These burgers taste like steak on a bun and are ultra lean and pack a bold, intense, beefy flavor. Save over 60% on dad's favorite grill pack, and you'll get four bacon-wrapped fillets, four premium air-chilled boneless chicken breasts, four boneless pork chops, four gourmet jumbo franks, four made-from-scratch caramel caramel apple tartlets, and an Omaha steak seasoning, plus the eight free Omaha steaks burgers for only ninety nine ninety nine. Remember, gifting is easy. Dads just want steak, and Omaha steaks isn't just steak; it's the best steak of your life, guaranteed. Don't wait. Go to omahasteaks.com, Type in "dead" d e a d into the search bar and order Dad's favorite package um, for Father's Day today. That is omahasteaks.com. Keyword dead. Um, you let me know when you got to go, Dallas. Uh, I have opted to miss the bus and walk. Oh, to the let's stadium. go. You're going to walk to the stadium. Yep. That's a beautiful part about this gorgeous beast of a ballpark out here. This gem dropped right in the heart of the city is I can just traipse my way right to the ballpark with not a worry in the world. Knowing that, no. <laughs> today I'm going to win. Today's a victory for DB. So, mm-hmm. well, what if what if the A's win? Because obviously you're not rooting for the A's. Because uh, let's be honest, happy plane flight. Why? Why? Because why wouldn't I? Because mm. you've made it. You're not even hiding it anymore. You've jumped off the A's bandwagon. No, I'm I'm just sporting some stuff that I got from the sweet Roberto Clemente Museum. No big deal. San Jose jersey. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. That's nice. That's pretty cool. As well as the old uh, painter hat. You're welcome. It's a nice hat. I like your Dallas hat. is right now is doing a tri- tryout for the Pirates. Trying to get in the Pirates. That's booth. what he is doing. <laughs> yeah. No, there's no there that 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 booth is secure. That booth has has one of the most yinzed out yinzers going with Neil Walker there. There's no, I mean, the guy. I think he was born like at second base here at PNC or Three Rivers. Like I just. The dude, um, yeah, that's his. Yeah, Roberto Clemente delivered him, didn't he? Yeah, I believe so. No, here's a, you guys, here's a great story, a true story. Neil Walker's father was actually loading the airplane with Roberto Clemente on the fateful night that Roberto would lose his life. And after packing the first two airplanes, it was the last one that, uh, that Mr. Walker was helping Roberto pack and he was on the plane. He was on the plane and Roberto told him, no, dude, you got to get off. You got to get off because I've already set things up here in Puerto Rico. It's new year's. Like my friends are waiting for you at these places. It's already been taken care of. You're going to go have a great time. So go hang out with the family, go hang out with the wife, watch the fireworks. We're, we're gone. I'll be back. And uh, n- not to get like too, deep and spiritual on this but the the story goes that his actual words to neil walker's father were where i'm going i'm not coming back and that leads into the premonition that roberto clemente was having for many many years of his life leading up to his demise so uh the the clemente museum was extremely moving for me just to listen to the stories so much so i went back I went yesterday morning and went back at night 
And I, I couldn't be more appreciative and thankful for the effort from my man, Dwayne Reeder, who uh, put all that together and runs the Clemente Museum. It's in an old firehouse. So there's a, just a, a ton of history with the city. and with, So just a, a phenomenal experience. It is an absolute must. It's not a suggestion. It is an absolute must, a bucket list item. If you are a baseball fan, if you're a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, if you're a humanitarian fan, I mean, they have a fucking propeller blade from the airplane sitting right there in the museum. Mm. It, it's just extremely emotional. It was for me anyway. Yeah, I got to check that out. You saw Corey Graves? I did see Corey Graves. Got to see Corey Graves and young cash money. Able to bring them down on the field. Got to watch BP. My man Cash is an A's fan. Love to see that. Absolutely love to see that. But uh, yeah, it was really cool to get uh, to get them down on the on the field, checking out the sights and sounds of the game up close. You can just see the smile on his son's face, like he was just in awe, like watching the Pirates players walk by. And we were talking chop, and he's a he's a stud little outfielder. So we were we I was kind of giving him some tips on on how to track down baseballs and become a fucking superstar. So it was a uh, it was a good time, man. Good time. You're welcome. You're welcome for uh, giving you more friends. No, we go. No, we go. We go back. It was just a matter of rekindling. Like we go. Right, right. Yeah, we go way back. Right. So, yeah, it's my friend, my lifelong friend. friend, my my very good friend. Mm-hmm. How uh, how do you think A's fans feel about you being a Pirates honk when the A's are playing the Pirates? How do they feel about that? I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, How if you listen A's to the broadcast feel about you gargling the pirates balls is what I'm asking while you're playing them. Well, see, A's fans understand the connection mm-hmm. for me and the pirates. You're blaming because they also your wife. no, no, they see they, they, the A's fans mm. see themselves in pirates fans. I think there's, there's a, a, a similar understanding between these two fan bases. Mm-hmm. Their passion, I think is derived from, from a lot of the same areas, if you will. Are you the ambassador? Like you're the glue guy? Oh, I'm not calling myself anything. I'm just, I'm uh, asking I'm just a baseball. I'm, I'm saying just those guy. words. No, no. Uh, ambassador for what? The merger. The, the, um, yeah, the, the, the A's <laughs> merger with the Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no, there's, there's no merger. There's no ambassadorship. I'm just a guy who happens to be blessed to be a fan of, uh, of two great teams, two great fan bases. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I got to shout out the Renegades of the Rotunda trying to talk that shit about how this series was going to go. I let them know that old Mitch Keller was about to get them tits lit, and it happened. And uh, I do want to thank them. To we got other stuff to talk about. I do want to thank them for the beers that they bought after the ball game to go ahead and pay respects. But uh, you hate to see it. You hate to see drinks. it. Um, you know what else you hate to see? Fucking Jacob deGrom getting another Tommy John surgery, which... <laughs> Uh, I was trying to say to a Rangers fan friend of mine that the body language of DeGrom coming off the mound in his last start was the most obvious. I need Tommy John realization body language perhaps we've ever seen in the history of the sport. Like that one, you never as a baseball fan, doesn't matter if you're a Ranger fan, DeGrom fan, whatever, uh, you do not put out into the universe Oh, that's Tommy John. You just don't do that. But that was the most slam dunk. Uh, we that's a Tommy John written all over it situation. Jacob Degrom is last time out. Well, it's uh, it's unfortunate that it has come to this, and it's unfortunate. I think that a lot of baseball fans have been, uh, you know, with a clenched jaw, sort of waiting for this moment. You hate to think that we've been waiting for this moment because it all it feels like what like there's five of us staring at each other right now, and it feels like all five of us at some point were like, well, kind of knew this was going to happen. Kind of felt like this was going to be an end result with all of the ticky tack injuries that have occurred. It felt like inevitably, as the focus started to hone in on one spot more and more, that this was going to be a result. It's heartbreaking. I think the Rangers are also heartbroken because well, they got zero insurance. Oh, not good. Uh, here was Jacob DeGrom um, talking about getting Tommy John surgery. 
it's tough, so. But. All right. You know, I, I went through this before and, you know, know what it takes to get back. Um, so that's the goal. Go out there, you know, rehab as the best I can and and be around to help, you know, any way I can. Um, you know, we got a special group here. Um, and. Mm. And then I'll be able to, to be out there and you know help them win. That's it's tanks. So this is what we love to do. But you know, finding this out, coming here more, wanting to be out there here and helping the team. You know, it's a, it's a disappointment. So obviously, yeah. a, a very emotional. Jacob deGrom, that's going to be a, a mixture of feelings there where that's all of it. That's yeah. All like of it right I, there. I want to be out there, but I can't be, I signed this huge contract with a new team. This is a, this is a huge letdown for me personally. And for them, <clears throat> a lot of people said a lot of haters said that this was going to happen and then it did. They're right. That sucks. Um, and also the mortality of you as a as a baseball player, where this is the second time you've gone through this. We don't know what his experiences were the first time he went through this. Um, mentally, it's when you're at the top of your game. And Jacob Degrom, I think people kind of misinterpreted what I said. I I didn't call him the pitcher of the generation. Like that's reserved for the the Kershaws and the Verlanders of the world. But had. Jacob DeGrom had the health of those guys. It's a different conversation. If he had made it to the big league sooner than those guys, it's a different conversation. When we're talking about the talent, the stuff, the ability. Uh, yeah, he belongs in that conversation. But he he didn't have the same health as those guys. He didn't get to the big leagues at the same time as those guys. Uh, so, yeah, that's got to be just an all encompassing, very shitty deflating, discouraging, depressing feeling if you're Jacob DeGrom. And all of it is like you said, and like I, I you can hear it in there, that that's that's pain from injuries 10 years ago. That's pain from not being able to be as consistent as he would have liked to have been over the course of his entire career. And that's pain from him knowing the narrative that surrounds him. And it's pain knowing that he is what I have said he is and what I think you guys could agree with when healthy, the greatest arm talent our game has. I, I can't, I, I agree. I can't help but contrast the conversation and the, 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 the feeling around Noah Syndergaard that we had the other day and mm. this, where Syndergaard is a guy who had the nastiest stuff and was at the top of his game and is miles away from even being able to grasp that same quality of stuff and effectiveness. Whereas Jacob deGrom, like every time he steps on the mound almost is peak performance or yeah. he, he was still bringing it this year and at a very, at arguably the best per inning level in the sport. And, um, but he can't stay healthy enough to do it over a sustained period. It seems like, so I don't, I'm not trying to say one's more frustrating than the other, but I, I just couldn't help but draw those that comparison um, from a guy who's lost it to a guy who just still has it but can't but can't stay out there. Um, well, no, I mean Jay, if you're giving your ligaments <clears throat> away to one of the two dudes based on what you see from them early, like you're going Jacob Degrom. Yeah, um, your point about maybe the greatest arm talent our game has. Just want to just want to reiterate how good Jacob deGrom has been. His peak has basically been from age 30 to 35, which is kind of unique in its own right. But mm -hmm. best adjusted ERA from age 30 to 35 all time. Jacob deGrom's at 191. Then it's a guy named Bullet Rogan at 168 and Randy oh Johnson at 167. So not only, yeah, I mean, Randy Johnson's peak was like my childhood. And I couldn't imagine a pitcher more dominant than what Randy Johnson was at his peak. And at least by ERA, Jacob deGrom is on a completely different level than what even Randy Johnson was doing, let alone what Mr. Rogan, Mr. Bullet was doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that your third cousin, Jared? Cousin Bullet? of the Rocket? Bullet? No, Bullet. Uh, R.I.P. Bullet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Randy Johnson was throwing fucking no hitters at 45, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, his peak where or his late thirties uh, with the D backs when he was winning like three Cy Youngs in uh, in four years or whatever it was. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the whole thing about DeGrom now we're talking 2025, like the rest of this year, kiss 2024 goodbye as well. Well, you're probably um, thinking like second half of 25. Maybe. I still think it's before I think, the all-star break in 25, but you never know. I mean, he's not, it's his second one and he's not a spring chicken either. The news release said that they were hoping to have him back by the end of 24, which I think if we're all, that's the hope right now. So if that's the hope right now, I think we can all just fast forward to 25. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. But you no. would hope the start of, you would hope the start of. Yeah. Well, and, uh, well, and to to the point about him not being a spring chicken, he could probably go one or two ways, right? And maybe this is a conversation they had with Verlander as well. We can either accelerate this as necessary, as needed. If you're feeling good, we'll keep going. We're, we're not going to pull you back. We're not going to, well, I know you feel good, but let's wait it out a little longer. We're not going to go that route because you're not a spring chicken. So if it's going good, we're going to keep it moving. Or they can say, look, you don't have the essence of youth on your side. So maybe we should take this a little easier. If you're going to give this one more go, and if you you want to come back, this is the way we think we could do it the best. So it'll be interesting to see how the rehab actually goes. Because I think we all in a perfect world would love to have more Jacob deGrom in our life sooner than later. But if it meant having more of Jacob deGrom over the long haul in our life, I think we would want that too. Yeah, I... It was very annoying seeing some of the reactions on Twitter being like, well, you know, he does it to himself. He doesn't have to throw a hundred and one out of here. Like Get he does it to his own here. body. Like, Shut the fuck up. Like Clayton up. Kershaw throws 93. Like that's yeah. why he stays healthy. Like Jacob DeGrom is out there throwing a hundred and one on purpose. Yeah, like, Clayton, Kers- yeah is- Clayton Kershaw is not getting ready three and a half hours before the game and loosening the backup and all this shit just because he wants to. Because he's like, you know what? I'd rather do that than the 95, 96 I used to have. I didn't right. like pitching then, so I'd rather throw in a fucking back injury and a lot of preparation because that's better. That sounds be- That's got longevity written all over it. There were people that were actually holding it against Jacob deGrom that he throws triple digits. It's like, well, yeah. maybe if he wasn't an asshole and didn't throw 100, fucking then clown. maybe he'd stay healthier and he wouldn't need to you know, shred every fiber in his elbow. It's like, fuck off. Uh, but I mean, I guess now, now is as good of a time as ever to revisit the Jacob deGrom contract. It's like, you know, we, I what? called it reckless. That's not to say that, I mean, no team should have offered him a contract. Be like, no, no, Jared, no, no t- insurance, no insurance, yeah, zero insurance on the contract. Yeah. Who, whose decision was that? Like someone's getting <laughs> fired for that. Like that's the, that's the reckless part. Yeah, it's that's almost like it's part. almost like hiring a contractor that's already ghosted you before and giving him sixty seven hundred dollars. And then when he ghosts you again, like being like, "Wow, I didn't believe that that happened. Like, that's kind of on you at that point. <laughs> that's I, the con- the insurance thing is a two way street, though. You got to find somebody who's willing to insure the contract. And the way that I read the Steven Strasburg situation, at least, was that the the cost of insuring it slash the availability of insurers to provide insurance for it was so limited and or so costly that there it basically was not an that's option. That's usually a bad and sign I, I'm not saying, if that happens. Well, that that's its own warning sign, right? For sure. But but I don't know if that's true with Jacob deGrom, but it, it's not always like, oops, we forgot to get insurance on it. If <laughs> It might be no one was willing to insure this contract. Um, yeah. Which, as Joey points out, m- might be something to consider before issuing the contract. But I just wanted to point that out. Is is there any way to salvage this deal at this point? Because like, if you sign them for five years, you're you're hoping that the front end of it, you're getting some prime years of Jacob Degrom, and you're willing to eat the you know the other end. side of the hill on the back end. Now you're only going to get the back end. Is there any way that this contract is salvaged? Yeah, the way the World Series when he comes back well, and he's beast like Justin Verlander. Could happen, man. You never fucking It's not impossible. No, no, it's not no I mean, in, in all honesty, Joey, if he rolls out fucking, uh, wins the contract up, 
28. He will have, when he comes back, I think he will have three more seasons. It was a five year so, deal, right? So he'll have 23, 24. So at the end of 27. So then ask yourself this at the end of 27, if Jacob deGrom has Plus made 50 starts, option. if Jacob deGrom has made 50 starts over a three year period and won the World Series. Is it salvageable? Is it salvaged? Yeah, I think so. I think if you just win one, I've always said that. If you win one in the window of a big contract and that player played a big role in it, then it's worth it. Jacob deGrom is getting $40 million next year to rehab. $40 million next year. The problem to Jared's point is that these were supposed to be the good years. Yeah, you're supposed supposed to cash in here. Right. And the team is clearly even more than we anticipated. This team is ready to go around Jacob deGrom, ready to compete for a World Series, and he would have given them the difference maker in the postseason that we talked about. Um, I, I, I mean, we should just get... I, it is a complete disaster that this is happening. There's as it, relates to, as it language, relates to Jacob deGrom's contract. Not necessarily... They can probably still win yeah. big without him. I think they've proven that to a degree, but as it relates specifically to this contract that they signed entering, this is as bad as it could have gone, obviously. So now like they are, there's a ton of language in this deal to where, to what J.A. mentioned earlier, the contract is through 2027. Now it's through 2028 because he got Tommy John. So it's almost like you, you lost, you're losing 2024. So now you owe us 2028. I don't know how wise that is, but here's how it's worded. Club option for 2028 is triggered if in 2023 through 26, DeGrom has Tommy John surgery or any right elbow or shoulder injury causing him to be on the injured list for 130 consecutive days um, in any season or in 186 days in a row during any service period. The club option triggers at 37 million. If during the contract, DeGrom finishes in the top five of the Cy Young vote, three times or more or pitches at least 725 innings. It triggers at 30 million. If the, if during the contract, DeGrom finishes in the top five of the Cy Young vote once or pitches at least 625 innings, uh, it triggers at 20 million. If DeGrom falls short of the higher performance thresholds. So that would be 20 million. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess unless he comes back in 25 or 26 and finishes in the top five of the Cy, right? Which, you're not necessarily mad about if you're I, if you're the Rangers and he comes back and does that. That probably says He'll good things it. about both your that you want him for that next season and what it did for your team in those seasons. So that makes a lot of sense. Gives them a little bit of protection, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's also like, all right, the engine in this new car that you knew already had a Carfax report attached to it blew out, and guess what? You get on the other end of that. The same car, the same engine, kind of tuned up, maybe some replacement parts. Well, not maybe. There are some replacement parts here, and we're going we're gonna to still run you out there, and we hope that you're able to run the race the way that we thought you were going to be able to run the race when we rolled you off the showroom floor. Like That's that was- our protection as an organization. I don't know if I would call that protection. That's just kind of hoping, hey, <laughs> if it holds up and it sticks together... <laughs> We're gonna run them out there again and see what we got with them. That's that's what we get. Like that's that's your answer. Like what are you getting on the other side of this, Texas? Well, uh, if the arm holds up, we're gonna get him again. Okay, but to what it? No, just like we'll just have him again, and it'll be after a second Tommy John, and it's gonna be later down the road. And uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's protection. That's insurance. Mm. Fuck. Yeah. So. The Texas Rangers, year one, by the way, year one of this deal was his age 35 season. They're losing age 36 and hoping to get him back for his first season with the Rangers, first full season in his age 37 season. That's the hope. So that's... (laughs) That's why we call it reckless, or at least I did. So it's a reckless decision by the Rangers. But to Joey's point, to Joey's point, you're kind of just, you're hoping that he's Justin Verlander 
You're hoping that there is a ton of gas left in the tank in the late 30s. It's happened before, modern day training methods, but Justin Verlander has been a a, a model of um, durability at least until, I don't know, a couple of years ago when he got clipped. Um, But he's in his late 30s. But when he's out there, your dude won the fucking Cy Young Award last year. He was what thirty nine. Yeah. Who so? Who's thrown more career innings? Do you think uh, Jacob Degrom or Steven Strasburg? Ooh, uh, Strasburg. Strasburg. It is Strasburg by about one hundred and twenty innings. Yeah. Wow. I would have guessed more. Yeah, I would have guessed more for Strasburg because he was just. He was going from 2012 to 2019. No, I, uh, yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, yeah. I just. Yeah. 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 Damn. Well, once upon a time, DeGrom really didn't was... get injured either. When he first came up. Yeah, that is once upon once a time. Once upon a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dallas, you got to get out of here? I got to go. I got to get to the yeah, park. What, a, what an honor. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for yeah. being here, Dallas. Good luck Any today. Any final thoughts before you head off to the ballpark? Go Pirates. <laughs> no final thoughts. Just, just looking forward to a great finish to a great series. A series after my own heart right now, Jared. And like I told you before, it's a beautiful day to be Dallas. Why? Because I can't lose today. Even should I lose, I will still win today. And I can't thank anybody outside of the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Oakland Athletics for putting me in that beautiful position. Those are my final wow. thoughts today. Get to the Roberto Clemente Museum. Unfortunately, the Clemente Bridge is closed for renovation. That doesn't mean that you can't take the Andy Warhol Bridge, which I'll be taking, to go over and maybe, just maybe, watch the Buckos. <laughs> I had a, I was going to do this thing where I, oh, is I got a bad pierogi. The flag, just the flag, because the A's are taking two out of three today, bitches. (laughs) Don't sleep. Thank you, Dallas. Double H on the mound. Thank you, Dallas. Appreciate that. You have a great day. Have a great day. (laughs) Yeah. I'm gone. All right, if you want to go check out the Oakland A's versus the Pittsburgh Pirates, one of the most highly anticipated series of the entire season, you got to head on over to Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events, it should not be a stressful experience. Game Time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets for their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped up for all the fun that you will have. Uh, I was just informed that I'm going to Chicago soon. Let's go. So, yeah. I, like today uh, soon or like next week soon? soon. Um, oh. I don't know what the dates are, but I'll be wow, in Chicago, you- which means I got to go to Wrigley. Wrigley is one of my favorites. Um, I don't know how. I don't know what my relationship is with Cubs fans. I don't know that I have one, to be honest. I think there's some Cubs fans, I think, that listen, but. For whatever reason, I think it's because of like during like the the old company days, there were just Chicago representatives, so no one cared to hear what I had to say about any Chicago teams. What? Come on, man. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm it's saying. True. So I, th- I think that's why I don't have a great. I don't not say I have a bad relationship, but I don't think that we have like a strong contingency. But I'll be there using the Game Time app. Get back to Wrigley. It's a great place. If you've never done it, you got to do it. Uh, forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Just two taps and you are ready to go tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email and of course we have a promo code for you download the game time app create an account use the promo code jared j-a-r-e-d for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account 
uh, download the app and use the promo code Jared for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Um, again, loaded, 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 loaded fucking show. Uh, we promised you an interview with Carl Ravitch, and uh, it's it's about a very important subject to a lot of folks out there, certainly everyone on this podcast. So without further ado, it is Carl Ravitch. All right. For prob- for the first and probably only time on this podcast, I'll be bringing in the guest. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, for us to be joined by a former colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, primarily to talk about uh, a cause surrounding dedicated to uh a former colleague of both of ours, current colleague of Carl's, um, Carl Ravitch of ESPN. Welcome to the podcast. Um, let's talk about stars for Sarah and Sarah Langs. All right, we will do that. And we'll also, at the end of this, talk about you allowing uh, guests in more often because you nailed it. You did a great job with that. Hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I want to just get that out there. And great to see Jared and Joey and Jake at Dallas. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, so the star over my shoulder, we started this um, – The concept probably about in the, I'll be honest, during the pandemic, long story short about the star, there's a little town in Connecticut called Chester, Connecticut. And there was a guy there who created these stars during the pandemic in an effort to, for nothing else, lift people's spirits. Uh, Many of you have probably been to Disney World. When you drive through downtown Chester, which is probably 300 yards long, that's it. But each side of the road in the uh, in the town looks like Main Street in Disney World, where it's just this sort of facade of restaurants and bars uh, and and pubs and, and things. And it's a really cool place. And then during the pandemic, when it was you know universally dark, this guy created these stars and everybody in the town purchased one. You know, they, they had them everywhere. So you're driving through what looks like the Milky Way. You know, you're just in a car. Nobody's really getting out, but you're driving through and you're looking around and you're seeing all these stars and they're different size stars. He's got big ones on different sides of the building. And then in 21, we find out that our buddy Sarah Langs has ALS. And it just struck me like, all right, so I drive through this Chester town in this dark period. She's got ALS, which is the worst diagnosis you can get. How do we marry these two things? How do we take these stars, which are beautiful? And they're small and they're spiritual, you know, and they light you up. You know, they, they lift your spirits. Um, how, how do we take that star and somehow apply it to benefiting Sarah Langs and ALS? And, you know, after a few meetings with each other, we came up with a Lang star, which, of course, is A-L-S, a Lang star. And we sell them for $50 uh, and you get one of these and you can get 100 of them and plug them in. And as as this became a thing, you know, I started to to fantasize about flying over the country from Hartford, Connecticut or Boston or New York and go to a game in San Diego or Los Angeles and look down and see a Langstar all over the country, like literally light up this country with with a Langstar. And as a result, let's fund research and end this damn disease because it's just the most insidious, worst thing that can happen. So thankfully, Major League Baseball and April Brown, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with her, but she's in charge of their outreach and and she is unbelievable. And she got behind it and Pat Courtney got behind it and Rob Manford got behind it. And on Friday night, as you probably saw, every one of the booths had a Langstar in it. I know, you know, Dallas is familiar with it and they had talking points around it. Um, And we did it on Sunday night. And look, Aaron Boone and Dave Roberts, they, they, you know, they, they fall under the category like most baseball people and certainly managers, like they get it. And they said, well, well, you know, we're good. Let's have one in each of our dugouts. So it went from zero to real, real far, real fast. And in just two days, we sold over 3,000. We sold like 3,300 in Canada. I went on Dan Schulman's uh, broadcast with the Blue Jays. They were playing the Mets on Friday night. So, you know, it, it, it took off. And the, the, you know, the interesting and, and kind of fun part about this is, is the, the elves in the workshop uh, are creating these stars. They're doing 100 to 200 every day. And it is elves in a workshop. I mean, this is, imagine a barn and wood from Home Depot and lights that are, are imported. And they literally hand them and put them together. And there's no issue with Denny the dentist yet. We haven't run into that type of, you know, somebody bailing on this because I didn't want to make these things. 
and it's raising a whole hell of a lot of money. And now my goal is to is to get one of these Langstars in every ballpark forever, like a retired number. Because as you all know, this is baseball's disease. Let's knock it out. Let's kill it. And the only way to do that is through research. And, and as much as the star is about Sarah, this is about every person that is affected by ALS, has been, or God forbid, someday will be and don't even know it yet. And the more I've I've talked about this, I will say the more people have privately said, my dad, my sister, my uncle, my aunt, my grandfather, it is it is scary how many people have been affected directly by ALS. So the place to go for these stars is starsforsarah.org. That's stars for Sarah with an H at the end of Sarah.org. And you can buy one, you can buy as many as you want. I would be grateful. She would be grateful. And everybody you know, that has ALS now or, or will be diagnosed with it will be grateful. And look, I got a shirt on. You guys all know baseball is best. There's a million ALS, you know, ways to donate. Please, any one of them is good by me and good by anybody. You just, we got to wipe this, this thing out. I know other people have questions they want to ask you too, um, but I just have one follow-up. Sarah's obviously a very inspiring kind of front for this um, for lots of different reasons. And I know you said that it, it, it impacts many people beyond her but it's not an accident that it's her that has motivated this. And if you wouldn't mind, like, I'd love for you to share with the listeners some of the details of your relationship with Sarah, how you got to know her, how she's impacted your life, um, because I do think she's unique in that way. Yeah, uh, she is. Sarah has a way of worming her way into your heart, um, regardless of baseball, which I'll get to in a minute. But she's that type of a person, she is tiny. I mean, she's four feet 11 and weighs, you know, 100 pounds at most. But she, she's she got this unique charisma about her, this smile. See, she and I are working on a book, and I interviewed her sixth grade teacher, Josh Backrack. And this guy was the one that kind of encouraged her to take this love of sports and baseball, and you can make a career out of this, which she's done. But when I called him to talk about Sarah, and I said, I'm writing a book. We're writing a book together. He said, well, you should. She's the most outstanding person I've ever met. You know, and this guy is 45, 50 years old. He's met a lot of people. And he goes back to a fifth grader. He was her sixth grade teacher, but they met in fifth grade when he was a substitute teacher. And he walked into this school in New York and she is sitting in the classroom. <laughs> and he's like, nobody ever gets to class before I did. And she was in the class. And while while they were waiting for all the other students, she basically gave him a scouting report on the students. Like that guy, Dallas, he's a troublemaker. Justin's really funny. You know, Jake is the one that's going to say nothing, but he knows all the answers. And Joey, Joey may show up. He may not show up. She, she literally broke down everybody in the class. And right away, she was in with this guy and they, they maintained a relationship forever. Um, you know, she was a uh, University of Chicago student who who went to work for the Chicago RSNs. She's one of those who actually thinks um, that the White Sox ballpark is is I'm not going to say more intimate, but she enjoyed that more than Wrigley. Like she's kind of an outlier in the way that she looks at things, but she loves everything. And there's just not many people who love the cell in Chicago more than Wrigley. She she's like, yeah, why wouldn't I? She she finds. She finds the positive in everything, and that's part of what makes her contagious. And she came to ESPN uh, in 15. So, And the other sort of odd connection between Sarah and I is Sarah was born on May 2nd of 1993. So May 2nd, 1993. May 2nd is the day that Gehrig's streak ended where his name wasn't in the lineup. So there's that connection to Gehrig. And while she was born on May 2nd of 93, I started at ESPN the day after, May 3rd of 1993. And then there we are 22 years later working together. And her dream growing up was always, once she started watching baseball, which is around four years old, to get to ESPN and to work on baseball tonight. And I know Justin knows that and Dallas knows that uh, as as former you know alumni and, and current alumni of baseball tonight. That was her dream. And for all the great researchers we had, and Justin was one of them, 
she came in there and just did, just just was a little different. Um, you know, her attention to detail, her ability to look forward at things, the way that she presented things. She she had handwriting that looked like it was a typewriter. And trust me, on that show, when you're getting updates in your ear, you know, at twelve fifty one in the morning, and there's some context that's necessary. Uh, occasionally, Havens or other researchers would kind of run up and hand a card to you, and you're like, "Okay, I can't read this." Every time she handed one to you, you're like, "Okay, that wow, does that make sense?" And then there's a little list added to a home run that a guy hit, and others that haven't done that yet, or the last time it happened. Um, and then we we just became friends because it, on this podcast, as you know, anybody that likes and loves baseball, well, right away they check the most major box, which is they, they're like me. They, they love this game. She loves it unequivocally. She never sees a negative in any of it. And uh, it's contagious. And over time, we just got to be very, very close. She, she's a little bit like a sister or daughter to me. Um, I love the person. I love the, the mom and dad. Uh, so it's, it's, it's crushing. It's devastating. And we all knew something was very, very wrong. Um, there was a party and. and Havens knows this, and Dallas has been invited to it, but I, I would host a baseball tonight party after every year, and there was one year where she was there, and she was in a, in a, you know in our family room, and she just fell down. Um, and this wasn't because of drinking or anything else, but she just fell down. And for a while, she'd sort of been, claim, been complaining about a bad ankle, um, and you know, bad ankles are one thing, but falling down and then not being able to to communicate from your brain to your foot to walk is a totally other one. And I carried her from my family room down to a car with her friends that was waiting. And we're all like, what the hell is happening? You know, this is, this is different. What is this? And she was in the process of, of getting the answer. So, you know, we're, we're all very emotionally attached to this um, is, and it's horrible, but she doesn't really allow it to be horrible right now. Um, I reached out to the Willie Geist Sunday Today show to, to please ask them to maybe do a story on her because she's such a unique person in a unique role. And and I got a letter, an email back from the producer that said, yes, we, we'd love to do this. Uh, we've done a lot of stories on people struggling with ALS, and we love the female in sports angle. And I forwarded it to Sarah to make sure she was going to be okay with it. And she's, you know, she's great about it. But her response to that was very typical Sarah. Yes, I'm happy to do it. You know, if my schedule in baseball, meaning my connection to baseball, will allow it. But I have a, I do have a little issue with the way that that letter was written, which was struggling with ALS. She's like, that's not what I'm doing. You know, I'm living with ALS. I am continuing to be me. And up until you know Friday night, the last time I was with her, that's how she wants to do this. Be me. I don't want to be associated with anybody that's struggling. I want to be a face for this disease. I want to be a face for the women that are dealing with this disease. And I want to be me. And she right now is knock on wood doing that. And that's, um, you know, that's why she's, she's such a special person in my heart and the hearts of so many. It's amazing, isn't it? The universal love and open arms that have been extended to Sarah Langs, who three years ago, four years ago, not a single person outside of her world knew. It's amazing. She does that. <clears throat> I uh I only had the pleasure of meeting her that one time at at Jay Hayes' wedding, which is like something that yeah. I I referenced that all the time because it was the first wedding I had ever been to where I didn't get judged for uh, looking at my phone and watching a baseball game while at a wedding because everyone else at the table was doing it too, <laughs> and that was that was Sarah. She, so talk about her her love for the game of baseball and how that's kind of. Uh, brought together kind of the 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 baseball tonight family over there yeah it, it's it is jared it's the baseball tonight family it's the baseball community and I, I think you know one thing that i've i've known i've learned from this experience currently the baseball community is is incredible when it needs to be i mean they, they can all have opinions about their teams and players and argue and debate but when it comes to helping somebody who they recognize is so enmeshed with this sport and and literally has this sport sustaining them. I mean, this sport of baseball is keeping her spirits up. It's keeping her sharp. It's keeping her alive. It's giving her a reason to get up every single day. Um, 
Now, I, I called her last week before this Lou Gehrig day on like, a, I think it was a Wednesday. <clears throat> and I said, before the game start, because when the game start at seven Eastern time, she's gone. Like you, you can't interrupt. I mean, you can send her an email, but you can't talk to her. I mean, she's got screens. She's watching every game. And I said, so before the game start, I just want to see how you're doing, you know, what your thoughts are about Friday, et cetera. And she said, um, well, the games have started. I'm watching the Marlins and Sandy's on the mound. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> of course, you know that. Like, I'm sorry, I'm a baseball guy, but I didn't know that Sandy Alcantara was on the mound and the Marlins were already started. But that's, again, that's how plugged in she is. Her, her love of baseball goes back to her mom and dad. Again, when she was four, they watched, you know, they watched games every night. Um, her grandmother was in San Francisco, and that's how she and her grandmother would relate to each other. They would send each other emails and phone calls back and forth about Rich Aurelia and his batting stance and, and anything that had to do with San Francisco baseball. They connected, and Sarah spent summers in San Francisco with her grandmother. Um, but but a Met fan from Jump Street because her dad was. <clears throat> her mom was a Giants fan. Her mom wanted to be a radio broadcaster. Um, then she got into medicine. Both her both her parents are incredibly accomplished doctors, brilliant people. She's brilliant, um, but it's it's in a way <clears throat> following in her mother's footsteps. You know, the mom wanted to be a radio broadcaster. Sarah does the first all female television broadcast. So th- there's a whole bunch of real good, strong, positive, uh, feminine role models in her life, and she's become that as well. So the baseball thing literally is in her blood. And she had no choice. And not only did she have no choice, I don't think she knew any Disney characters like most kids do uh, (laughs) until she was about 12, because she was really focused on baseball and never concerned herself with any of the Disney characters or Snow White or any of that stuff, which shows you where her mind was and how she followed suit with her mom and dad. Well, Rav, you you instantly and and I had the, the privilege, the honor of being on air with her for the very first time at ESPN. Myself, Adnan, I think it was Timmy. And you could tell right away, right away, there's people who walk into a room and command the respect with their presence or with the dirt under their spikes, their status in the game or in the business. And you made a great point. Sarah is 4'11", 100 pounds. But the minute that she opens the notebook and the minute that she starts to speak, it is a heavyweight champ throwing blow after blow after blow of fact of interesting, uh, of just interesting nuance of the game. So just what was your very first impression? The minute that you hear her voice, because it's not, <laughs> it's not like you expect it to boom the way it does, but it's everything, the substance that comes with it, that just snaps your head, grabs your attention. And you're almost watching those beautiful handwritten words that you got to read come out and it's it's really it's like a baseball song right yeah so i mean in a look in a baseball world when you think about um mariana rivera coming into the game like you know the game's going to end and it's going to end positively sarah was like a closer she she was she's the most unintimidating intimidating person <laughs> on the planet like you realize really quickly that any type of argument that you might have with her or debate or discussion you're going to lose because it's based in fact you know she's a researcher that that's why she's behind project als as opposed to perhaps any other als because project als is all about research and justin can appreciate this she's about research she she's not about generally saying, well, my gut tells me this, or here's what my eyes tell me. And there's a place in the game of baseball for all that. But you lose when you argue against her because it's all based in fact. It's all based in numbers. It's all based in analytics. And uh, that's my point about, and nothing about this 411 person is going to make you think like, I can't go near that person. She's, you know, I'm going to get pounded. I'm going to get run over. And she never ever makes you feel like the question is like, ooh, like you don't know that answer. Or by the way, uh, baseball reference, baseball savant, you, you could do the same thing I do and type it in there, but her ability to kind of get the wheel spinning so far ahead of where you are, you know, imagine baseball teams now, the ones like the Rays uh, and the Dodgers and whoever 
whoever used analytics to their advantage in the beginning and you realize like, wow, the, you know, Jared, the Red Sox were a little bit behind when it came to analytics and now, now everybody's caught up. Well, Sarah, like nobody is really caught up yet. Like she keeps finding a new lane to go into to keep that, that car ahead of everybody else. We all now know, yeah, I could, I could go to fan graphs or any of those other websites like she does. But she's a bit of a computer in a human's body. She's she's just doing it much quicker, and then she makes it so that we all understand what the hell it is that those that those baseball savant things say. She's she's just really a great bridge between between the old and the new. And and yeah, Dallas, she's uh, she's makes you realize like there's there's just a real smart 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 person in the room who happens to share the love of the game that we all do. So if any of the any of the listeners want to uh, buy a star, where can they do that? Yeah, so you can go to stars for Sarah with an H dot org stars for Sarah with an H dot org. One hundred percent of the proceeds go to Project ALS. And uh, I'm absolutely, you know, blowing the horn for Sarah Langs because as a researcher, she knows that the chances of her surviving are zero. That's what the research says. She knows that. She's not living that way. Um, currently, she's able to work and will be with us every Sunday. Um, but she knows what the research says. And now we have to fund the research so that those percentages change. But it's zero. And it's been zero since Lou Gehrig was diagnosed. And there's nobody that's escaped uh, the jaws of this, this goddamn disease. So she's funding research. Stars for Sarah with an H dot org. Please, you know, share the link, share this thought with anybody. It's $50. And in a lot of ways that, you know, this star is Sarah. It's small. It's beautiful. It lights up a room. It's just smart. And we would be grateful for anybody that would go to that website, stars for Sarah with an H dot org uh, and buy one. I, I think it's incredible that, uh, I mean, from an outsider's perspective, that Sarah has not lost who she is. And, and yeah. that, that's something that I would tell people about Pete Frades, where once his ALS had gotten to the point where he could no longer verbally communicate, there were a couple of times where I would be at his house and he, he can type with his eyes and he yeah. would say some of the funniest shit. Like he, he never <laughs> lost his sense of humor uh, over the course of it getting worse and worse. And I had seen the uh, the video of Sarah's boyfriend throwing out the first pitch and it was right. horrible. And she's just laughing in his face. <laughs> like that's that's like, you know, that's one of those things. It, it reminded me of Pete, you know, when uh like you get the worst news ever and it doesn't take away from who you are as a person. I think that that's really cool. A hundred percent. And I think I've had a lot of conversations with people about her and her way. And, you know, until you until you were to be able to walk in either of Pete's or Sarah's or anyone else's shoes, it's impossible to say how you'd respond to a diagnosis like that. It's impossible. Um, but there is a part of you that wonders, you know, OK, well, how how would I deal with this? What, what would you hope that you would you would do with it? Um, and boy, I marvel at the way that she's she's currently dealing with it and confronting it. And, and I know that she's a pain in the ass to every one of her doctors, because, again, imagine being the doctor with a researcher whose folks are both deep into the highest level of medicine you can be in, that anything he brings up, she's going to have an answer to. And she's going to see, why aren't I doing that? Why aren't you prescribing that? How can I get on that? Where can we find that drug? What is it going to take for me to do this? She's drilling, drilling the doctors um, to to make sure that she can continue to do this. Because again, you know, w when you're told you're going to die is one thing. It seems like in her case, when you're told that this may impact your ability to do what you love, forget about dying, but do what you love. That's when the the you know, spines on her back get up. Like no way, you're not telling me I can't be involved with baseball. I mean, the amazing part when she called me and I was I was sitting in a sitting right where I'm sitting now and told me about this. Um, she was so concerned that somehow this is going to impact her ability to work, that she was going to get fired from her jobs. Like that was her biggest concern. 
It wasn't, I'm going to die, you know, in five years. It wasn't, uh, I'm going to be in a wheelchair. It was, I'm not going to be able to, to do what I want. And of course, those of us that had that conversation with her, it felt like, well, that's an interesting take. And there's no freaking way anybody's going to fire you because you like that. Sorry, but that doesn't make sense to me. But if that's where you're going, you know, we'll do what we can to talk to people to make sure like that never happens. Not that it would, but that was her biggest concern. And she has said a, a number of times, you know, like Pete, I'm sure did and expressed to you, I'm not going to stop being me. And me, in Sarah's case, is baseball. That's it. I mean, it is. I can't emphasize enough this affair with baseball. And we go back and forth on what the title of the book should be. But there's there's real support from me for the story of baseball's biggest fan ever. I mean, there's nobody who likes the game, who who sees things in the game that I've ever come across like her. And I'm sure there's many that, that do, but none that I've ever found who's this unique blend of, of A, baseball fan, woman, which is, again, different, growing, thank God, in our sport, but but unique, um, you know, and literally lives and dies with the game of baseball every single day. So she's uh, she's like that. She wants to be Sarah Langs, which means I want to be involved with baseball. You said Sarah Langs is baseball. It's also apologizing uh, for things that she shouldn't apologize for. <laughs> and just to your point about Sarah uh, staying true to herself, uh, over the last maybe like five or six weeks, we've been going back and forth about getting together uh, for lunch. Uh, and I happen, she said Saturdays tend to work best. And I happened to text her leading up to a Saturday where Matt, her boyfriend, was very busy with what I should have known was the NBA playoffs, right? Right. And she said, oh, I can't do it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And there was a pause between me responding to that just because I got caught up with something probably with my daughter. And I, I go back to my phone and I had an all caps text from her saying, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be mad. And I'm like, I'm just shaking my head like, all right. It's never going to change. No. And I never, I never would want it to. Right. Um, I really appreciate you coming on, Ravi. Well, I, I'm grateful you guys had me on. Uh, to to Justin's point about being sorry and all these things, the other thing that Sarah does is thank you for everything. And if you screw up, she'll say thank you. It doesn't matter. After every show, she would send an email to me saying, thank you, so great to be a part of it Sunday night. Thank you, so great to be a part of it. Uh, KBO games, thank you, so great to be a part. It doesn't matter. Thank you, so great to be a part of it. And I thought, hmm, okay, this is... I'm kind of unique. You know, she's thanking me like this is special. And then you come to ask Justin or <laughs> Braden, everyone on the planet got the same thank you email that I had just gotten. So she's she's that grateful for just being involved with baseball people and the game of baseball. You guys are wonderful. Thanks so much for the platform. Next time, let's talk baseball because that's what she'd want us to do. But stars for Sarah with an H dot org is where you can go to get the stars. Awesome. Thank you, Ravi. Thank thanks, you. Ravi. Great to see you, buddy. Big thanks to Ravi for making the time coming on today. Shout out to Sarah Langs. If you are not following her, what is it? S Langs on sports. Is that it? Slangs on sports. Yep. Slangs on sports is the Twitter account. Sarah is uh, the top dog as it comes to baseball research. Uh, her Twitter account, if you're not already following her, I'm assuming that a bunch of people listening already are following her. If you're not, you're missing out. Get in on the action. Um, and, uh, shout out to Ravi for coming on. Make sure you go buy a star. I'm going to be doing that. Um, for sure. Throwing up <clears throat> in the fucking studio right here. That would be great. Uh, a loaded podcast continues to roll on a Wednesday podcast. This, this almost broke Twitter. Ellie De La Cruz called up to the Cincinnati Reds yesterday. The highly anticipated call up. So much so that a friend of mine, Cincinnati Reds fan, uh, he was the one that tipped me off and said, hey, uh, I was trying to buy tickets to the game. The, the ticket website on Reds.com crashed, crashed. People were trying to get tickets to the game. Website crashed. Um, it was Reds Dodgers. What? And this is just the beginning. Like they've got more coming. Like the Reds have more coming. And that's why I said, if you're uh, if you're kind of like a refugee A's fan. You're looking for a place to settle down. 
you don't want to follow the A's to Vegas. I wouldn't. I wouldn't rule out being a Reds fan. I know a lot of uh, uh, A's fans have already dispersed to other organizations already. Some, maybe you're going to stick with the A's. Others, maybe you're kind of looking around saying, oh, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to I'm going to see how the rest of the league, the, the landscape pans out before I settle down with my new sports franchise. I would ask that you consider the Cincinnati Reds. Um, Jay, hey, where would you if you were if you were a refugee A's fan, what what organizations are you looking at maybe hopping on hmm. and where would you put the Cincinnati Reds in terms of future forecasting? So what you're really looking for is a team that's not too popular already, right? Mm-hmm. And not and not too good already, but with the promise of maybe being good or at least exciting in the future, right? Talking D-backs. Yep. I think I think you have to put the D-backs at or near the top of the list. My concern with both the D-backs and the Orioles is that you might have already missed the boat. Mm. Are they too good too fast? Mm. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. But uh, I think that's a question that you would have to. Texas is already way too good. Um, hmm, That's a good question. You know, I was going to balk at the Reds thing, but I do think Ellie De La Cruz it might be exciting enough as a as a single player to justify changing your fandom all by himself, regardless of what's coming behind him or what's already on the roster, because. It's just very rare that you see guys that are that big with that much power and that much speed kind of all together. Uh, and he just pops off the he pops off the screen. I tuned in. That's a prospect. That's an at bat that I was tuning in to watch. Watched each of the first two. I saw that smoke double. Um, I think they said it was 112 miles an hour already. Yeah, Honestly, which is kind of day. crazy. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. Um, no, but I think. I, I guess I, I think that D backs, Orioles and and Reds are probably the best candidates for what you're talking about. Um, but I'm really excited about him. And he's in the middle of the infield too. Which is kind of neat. He he's is. got everything in theory. Um Joseph, if you're trying to map out where to jump ship to, let's just say you're uh you're an A's fan. Where would you put the Cincinnati Reds in terms of uh organizations worthy of your fandom well i guess yeah they have to i guess they i got something to go under the same guys that jay had went under can't be two beasts but gotta be beasts in the future um yeah reds uh <laughs> i know they're dude they're on the edge of their seats right now because i could just damn the Reds organization right now and they will never be good again but it, I'd put them behind the O's because I'm going with the O's because you know I love the O's but the Reds are pretty good mm. too I would take the Reds I would go with the Reds they got great starting pitching and everyone in their team is young except for Joey Votto and Ellie De La Cruz That's you gotta look up the clip of him and I think it's Matt McClain's celebration when they win the games in AAA or AA or whatever it was one of the sickest mm-hmm. celebrations ever. They did like an alley oop on second base between the legs and threw a fake hoop in Ellie De La Cruz's arms. And then they do like a dap behind the back. Like, <laughs> you can't even put it into words. <laughs> the cool thing I, about I, the red. Go ahead, Jared. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think that I think the reds tweeted a video of that celebration when Ellie got called up because they were like, oh, the celebration's coming to the big leagues. Go ahead, Jay. The cool thing about the Reds is that at least in theory, they have like maximum electricity at both the plate in De La Cruz, who I already talked about, and then Hunter Green on the mound. Like that hasn't materialized in terms of actualized performance for Green yet, but like all of the, all of the tools are in the toolbox, so to speak. For him to be that sort of player, so I think that lends credence to the idea that our Reds are the team you can get behind. Plus, I mean, if you're into this kind of stuff, they have they are the oldest Major League Baseball organization that exists. Mm. They have great history. They've got the Big Red Machine. You've got the Hoffer B Lark <laughs> Barry Larkin. Yeah, still flown around. You've got the opening day parade and celebration in and around the stadium. Which, if you haven't been to, and you're already in the city of Cincinnati, I would recommend that you check out 
Uh, not sure I'd go specifically for it, but if you're in, if you're in Ohio, give it a shot. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, the question, the question with all three of those teams is, will they invest in their core long term? But no reason to cloud this conversation with that sort of reality. Let's just appreciate Ellie De La Cruz. Um, breaking news. I just noticed that Matt McLean follows me on both Twitter and Instagram. So that's Ooh. cool. We can get him on the podcast. It sounds like. Getting all sorts of content from you. Yeah, let's go Reds, baby. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I'm an idiot. I don't that. That must mean that he's been like following me since like fucking high school or college, because I would have noticed that coming across if it was somewhat recent. <clears throat> 40 homers and 58 stolen bases over 159 minor league games for De La Cruz prior to the call up. 40 homers and 58 stolen bases. You could cut those numbers in half for a major league season and they would be wildly impressive. Yeah. He's so fucking fast. Did you see the so the, fast the video of uh it was behind home plate? I don't know who was in front of him, but then you just see Ellie burning around third and like almost catches up to the runner in front of him. Freakish Dude, was, speed. Like the, yeah. the the ball that he hit in the gap. Uh, he kind of just glided from first to second. It was so effortless. I, I'm i very excited for the Ellie De La Cruz uh, era in Cincinnati. I hope it's not one of those things where um, there's like a sophomore slump in it and we have to have the conversation like, oh, like, oh he, the league adjusted to him. Like, is he going to adjust back? Like, I fucking hate that shit. But one of the things <laughs> that we did just have adjust. to talk about. Yeah, just fucking adjust, dude. It's not that hard. Um, the Jonathan India Ellie De La Cruz Beef. drama. So <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. Oh, what why. I mean, like you're this? the Cincinnati Reds. This? Like you, it's a you, massive beef. You, you need a leader. Jonathan India is that guy. Like this is his team now. Um, so Rosie, Chris Rose was talking to Jonathan India about the trade rumors. And this is what he had to say. I thought you did a, a column with Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic the other day where he talked about, hey, when De La Cruz gets up here, there's a lot of position players in the middle infield for only a couple of spots. How do you deal with that? Are there times where you're like, I really want to be here? Like, please don't send me out. You know, there's rumors about it going around that, you know, I could possibly be a guy getting traded. I love this team. I love this organization, you know, and I love the city. One rookie of the year here and... It was all for the city and, you know, the fans make me feel special. But that's just part of the business. You know, I, I know where I stand with this team. I hope that's not going to happen. Uh, they tell me it's not. So we'll see. I'm going to give my my all for this team no matter what happens for the rest of the time. So I'm just excited to be a Cincinnati Red right now. You said that's what they told me. So that that's what I kind of took out of that was, yeah, listen, there's probably going to be some rumors about what do we do with Jonathan India now that Ellie De La Cruz is coming up. Um, Jonathan India was told by the team, and that doesn't mean shit. Like we've we've seen plenty of players be like, no, 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 no. you're you're safe, you're good, you're good, you're you're good. No, send them to the Giants. Like it's it's happened before. Um, but yeah, the Reds the Reds need guys like Jonathan India as the guys like Ellie De La Cruz come up. Like they need you can't. What what was it? Two thousand sixteen. When the Astros got all of their like young studs started coming up and they didn't really take off until they added like the, the veteran guys like McCann and Reddick and fucking uh, uh, Beltran. Like, but we all know what was going on, but like that they needed those veterans to kind of gel everything together. Also, what are, what are we doing? Jonathan India is 26 years old. Yeah. The idea the idea that he like I, your point is well taken. He's young enough to fit with Ellie De La Cruz over the next half decade. The Reds are not so talent rich, either in the majors or in the minor leagues, where they should be casting aside Jonathan, players like Jonathan India. He has been really good for them this season, rock solid after. So this is going to make two of three seasons where he's been a real asset for them after kind of a loss 22, which I think can be chalked up a lot to injury. Um that was known at the time, but like, I just, to me, like, I guess in the sense that anybody is available or almost anyone is available that they might take calls on Jonathan India, but I have no idea why you would actively shop him simply because Ellie De La Cruz 
has been called up. There are lots. This team needs more talent. Not well, less. they also got Matt McClain, particularly in the middle of their career. I think Mac Mac McClain is kind of the guy who's really pushing that envelope because he's been a fucking beast, and he's like about the same age but, as Ellie. Why can't all of these people play? Well, I guess they could, but I mean, they're both they're all middle infielders. So there's three of them, and there's two middle infield spots. But yeah, you could DH or get us someone in left field, right field. Everyone fucking does it. But then it's kind of the conversation. It was like, do you move Jonathan India for these young cats when he's supposed to be the leader of the squad? And he's the vo- leader, everyone keeps saying, which could be true. But it's funny because he is young as fuck as well. And he just won Rookie of the Year two seasons ago. And people are like, how could you get push this veteran aside for these young cats? Kurt Herbstreet is pissed about it. He's on Twitter <laughs> talking shit because Jonathan India is the leader when Joey Votto isn't around. I saw that. That dude, um, what is it? Something Trent? See something Trent? Yes. Yeah, he, I, I think Herbstreet was over his skis, to be honest he, with you. Yeah, he, he, he started off making sense and then once he start he kind of like outed himself a couple of times well what one of those times is how do you not know the beat writer of the cincinnati reds if you're a hardcore cincinnati reds fan when the beat writer has been there for i I don't know exactly 20 years yeah he's been there a long time and then he was also what the president of the bbwaa or whatever yeah this isn't some like herb street trying to pass him off as some random asshole it was he's like an institution in that city from what i gather yeah, and you're, a, you're a big time Reds fan that lives and breathes with the Reds. You've never heard either. He's a liar and has heard of 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 Rosencrant, Rosencrantz and or. And was just trying to make him feel small or he's never heard of him. And then you have to answer how invested in the Reds is Kirk Herbstreit and why are we talking? I don't about know, man. I right? think yeah. you can be a hardcore fan and not read the fucking beat writer, you know? No, no, uh, no. You can't not be for somebody that media. age. Maybe somebody maybe in your 20s now you can do that. I find it hard to believe that Kirk Herbstreet was a hardcore Reds fan from like 2004 to 2023 and didn't know who their main beat writer was. Yeah, you can't do Bullshit. that. Yeah, like he, especially one that's online. Like, I don't expect my dad to know like who all like the uh, Red Sox beat guys are like he knows who like the, the columnists are, but he, he he won't know who some of like the main writers are that are big on Twitter, but this dude is on Twitter and he, that, that reds writer has had me blocked for years. I think <laughs> it's just because I, I never, I never engage them. I never talk to him. I'm assuming it's like, because he doesn't like the old company. Um, but I know who he is and I've seen him like when I first got on Twitter back in 2009, like this guy, uh, like I had, I had like a, a list of all the, the at least one writer from every single MLB team that I followed. And he was the guy. So uh, he's been around. He's the yeah, Reds. That's a, that's a, that's an indictment. He's the Reds genius, the most genius Reds guy. And Kurt Herbstreit tried to make a Reds take. Sorry, buddy. I didn't know who, th- I didn't know who the football guy was until this spat. You happened. didn't know Kurt Herbstreit? Herbstreit? No. See, there who you go. He? Hardcore football fan. Jared didn't know Kurt Herbstreit. So I can see how Herbstreit would know who, this guy is who I don't even know his name either, even though I do follow him. Who is he? He's a college football analyst. On he calls the college football games on Saturday nights. Yeah, he's been on he's been on the game day and stuff like that for years. I'm a little bit shocked you don't know who Kirk Kirk Curb Street is, but that's no idea. You're not losing anything because you don't, but I'm just surprised that incidentally you haven't run into Kirk Herb Street over the years. <laughs> no. Just on your TV, not in person. I mean, I just if if I'm not watching baseball, the TV's not on. If the TV's on and it's not baseball, then it's like a hard or movie. Bruins, so, he, right? <clears throat> Fake care. Bruins, Fake Bruins fan, Fake Bruins fan. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not Who's really their B writer, motherfucker? You don't know. Uh. Who's the Bruins main beat writer? Mm-hmm. Pete Blackburn. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's who it is. Uh, Joe, what the fuck's going on? What's uh, what's with the drama last night with you guys? Braves, Mets. You got Pete Alonzo talking shit. 
Uh, you got Tyler Matzik throwing it back at him. It's a it's a whole thing. Look at this. Listen, listen, Pete the meat. Come on. Found too much Hold of the plate. Again. Hold again, please. Hold again. What's the context there? So, uh, like the the first thing that came across my radar was Pete Alonso saying, "Throw it again, throw it again, please." But it, it sounded like the Braves started it. Did the Braves start it? Joe? I did not see that. God, I don't know either because that, that did seem like it was out of nowhere. I'm sure there was something happened. I don't know. But from right, my, it sounded like what? It sounded like the Braves started the throw it, throw it again thing first. When? And I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I need some evidence. I don't think, I mean, did it just come out of nowhere where you, like, I don't, I can't see Pete Alonso hitting a bomb of someone and be like, throw it again. And there's never be any beef between the teams at all. Any shit talk, but I haven't seen any concrete evidence of when it started or how it started i just it started with pete alonzo saying that in my brain bryce elder said he didn't hear pete alonzo saying throw it again asked if he would be upset about it elder said no if i hit one to the concourse i might holler too so bryce elder didn't even have an issue with it but obviously the other guys on the braves bench did and then you had tyler matzik saying the same thing, um, which is like the perfect chirp. Like, obviously, if you're going to be the Mets and you're going to start talking shit, you've got to be able to back it up. And the Braves had a four run sixth inning, which ultimately led to a six, four victory over the Mets. Uh, we know what the history is between these two teams. They blew the division to the Braves. Um, it is uh it's just, I don't know. I feel like you're you're going to get your old fans. You're going to get old fans that are like, yeah, um, I, I, this there's no place in the game for stuff like this. Like, just play the game and like play the game with respect. And like, don't like talk like, no, fuck that. Like, I want the players to hate. There's too much kumbaya going on. You got all these players that are buddies. You got Mookie Betts interviewing Aaron Judge now. Five years ago, they were in a brawl, and now now they're buddy buddy doing interviews with each other. No, I I need more. I need more. Uh, I need more of this. I hope it gets even worse. I hope the Mets keep talking shit because <laughs> you know what I'm saying they start it, we finish it. Since since Alonzo said throw it again, the Mets have zero hits. Hmm. Sucks. To suck, Mets fans. And I have video picture evidence of your your franchise cheating. I have evidence of that. And I will drop it on Twitter publicly for the world to see. And then you're going to be fucked if you keep talking shit. Which right now they're not. You have evidence of who cheating? I have evidence of the Mets cheating. Picture. And who else has this evidence? Just me. That I know of. I'm the only one. Where did you get it? Where'd you acquire it? It doesn't matter because the, I've already said too much, but let's just say I've already said too much. Let's just say be very careful, Mets fans, because I will sink the entire ship if it already isn't sank. Because right now the Mets are behind the freaking Miami Marlins right now, which is very sad considering the Mets have paid two pitchers, two players more than the entire payroll of the Miami Marlins. Not to mention, they're the fucking Miami Marlins. You're the big, bad, scary Mets. Not so much. It's more like the measly Mets and your cheaters. And you got embarrassed last night, as usual, when you play the Braves. So that's that's uh, it's quite the threat, Joe. Hey, man. <laughs> do the crime, do the time. They cheated. You, I have evidence. Are you going to bring this organization to its knees? I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to present the evidence like I am like a, as a journalist, as like a guy in the media. Like I'm kind of, I have to do this. Mm. I don't want to do this. going to be in a YouTube video. Or are you going to tweet it? What are you going to do? <sighs> I don't know. I might, I might just send it to Manfred right up, straight up, bro. Wow. <laughs> straight up. That's just, that's integrity right there. You're not even doing it for content. You're just doing it for the, <laughs> the sanctity of the game i would love that'd be a great video if you had video evidence of a team cheating 
And then you gave it to Rob Manfred. It's on a piece of paper. Gave it to him. And he filmed him. His reaction. What are you going to do, Mr. Manfred? <laughs> Balls in your court. Will you give the Mets franchise the death penalty, which they deserve for this? Mm. But that doesn't matter. You guys don't know what it is. No one knows what it is except for me. Okay. I'm just warning the Mets fans. Shut the fuck up. Because for three innings, you guys were getting the, you guys were getting there. I could feel it. Because Mets fans have been chilled this year because, you know, they haven't been good. They haven't been, they haven't played the Braves a lot. We played, we got a lot of games rained out. But last night after the throw it again, I could feel them getting a little excited. Hmm. And they come back and is throw it again. Is throw it again going to end up being the rally cr- cry of the 2023 Atlanta Braves? I think it could be. I think when we play the Mets, I think that's going to be the meme. And you know, the Braves, Braves Twitter is kind of like they're really they're you know there's a lot of memes going around there. You know, there's a lot, <laughs> yeah. of, a lot of people <laughs> who like the Braves like memes, and they like to tweet at people and you know <laughs> talk shit, love them for it, love Bloop of all the guys. And girls. Yeah, Bloop was going in hard last well, night. Bloop doesn't give a fuck, bro. No, he really doesn't. We still never had whoever um, portrayed Dandy, the Yankees mascot, has never come forward. Yeah. Makes me believe that either he has been killed by the Yankees or is uh, signed an NDA or was paid for his or her silence. It's yeah, damning. I, I would have assumed we gave Dandy plenty of time to come forward. Yeah, <laughs> Dandy and, had 48 crickets. hours to come yeah. forward. Nothing. Silence. The silence is deafening for Dandy. It is deafening. Deafening um, Dandy. Deafening Dandy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I think it's not. The fact that Aaron Judge going to the injured list is so far down the list on things that have happened in the last 48 hours is incredible. You had the baseball is dead parlay hitting. You had Jacob DeGrom, Tommy John. You had Ellie De La Cruz getting called up. You had Alec Manoa getting sent to the minors. You had the Braves and Mets drama. Now, and you had Carl Ravitch. Now you have Aaron Judge to the injured list, which, by the way, now that I've slowed down the video, he punted the fuck out of like a cement slab at the bottom of that wall. When you're watching the video in real time, you see it and you're like, oh, uh, that's that looks like it could be a shoulder injury. He just shoulder tackled the door open. But as he's running, one of his strides just takes his right foot directly into a cement mm. wall when he's running full speed. Um, what are they calling it? A sprain? Yeah, OK. Wink, wink. <laughs> sprain. No fucking chance, dude. It is. That thing is shattered. <laughs> uh, Aaron Judge toe. Let's see. What are the? What's the official diagnosis here? It was. Uh, uh, oh, here's 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 my guy Boney talking about it. Speaking of offense, you were without a big piece of yours this evening. And Aaron Judge, were you able to have a conversation with Doctor Ahmad? What's the diagnosis there? Yeah, so he's he is going to go on the IL. Um, He's got a, a contusion and a sprain um, of the ligament. Um, so he had a PRP shot tonight. And then, I mean, the biggest thing now is, is you know, trying to get the swelling out of there. Um, had some improvements today. Um, but, you know, now we'll just see where we are in the coming weeks and or days and then, you know, week. But the biggest thing is getting the, the, uh, the swelling out of there now. So absolutely no break or, or fractures in the toe? No. Liar! It's broken. That thing is broken <laughs> as fuck, Booney. Um, which is fine. You you don't have to you don't have to admit it. You, you know, you know that I know that we all know. But Judgy hitting the injured list for the second time this year, and it sucks. He statistically is on pace to have a better season this year than he did last year, which is disgusting when you think about the season that he had last year. How could it be better? Hey, uh, take a seat. I'll show you the Yankees record. This is this is not um, this is not something to be taken lightly here. The Yankees record 
when Aaron Judge is not in the lineup is six and seven, which kind of goes back to my point earlier. Like there, which is you know when people are like, well, you know, like Shohei Otani and blah blah blah. There's no player that has a greater impact on the performance of his team than Aaron Judge. Well, I think if you take if you take Aaron Judge off the Yankees, they're not a good team. Like he, he goes out there and he'll hit fucking two home runs and rob a home run and throw someone out at second base. And like, I'm not, this is not a, is Aaron Judge better than Shohei Otani? Shohei Otani is a better baseball player than everyone on planet Earth. He can pitch, he can hit, he does them both well. Like he is, he is in that sense, the most valuable player. But when you talk about, like, if you take, Shohei Otani off the Angels, like it's not like they're just they're, they're the fucking Angels. They're they're the Angels. Like they still yeah, lose I mean, with him. So <clears throat> that like there are multiple games where the Yankees won because of Aaron Judge. You take Judge off the team, they're no longer a good team. They are a mediocre team. Well, it speaks to both Judge's talent and one of the Yankees issues, which is not a great amount of depth, particularly for a Yankees team. Yeah. And so it's it's just as much about how great is Aaron Judge, and it's also about who will be replacing him and who will be taking his at bats and stuff like that. So I agree wholeheartedly with you. I think we've talked about it before, where uh, Dan Zaborski does like the most irreplaceable players uh, in a given season on Fangraph sometimes, and like what if this player were to miss the entire season, who would be the most impactful? And Judge is always at or near the very top of that list. Um, he is the definition of irreplaceable. So. We'll see whether your speculation is correct about whether it's a shattered toe, uh, whether he needs it amputated or not. But um, I told him he could have mine. I don't care. You did. I, you did I want that. him to have mine. Yeah. Um, Couple. Of that's them. that's the right word. He's he's more irreplaceable. Not saying that Otani is replaceable. He's not. Hmm. But you. No. Well, I mean, Otani's just as irreplaceable. It's just about how relevant are the teams, right? It's more of an indictment on, on the supporting cast than the player. Yeah. And, and it's also like the, we're viewing it like the Yankees games have higher stakes than the angels games this year. Like that's just baked into the conversation here, right? Mm -hmm. Like that the Yankees are potential playoff contenders in the way that the angels are not. And that's why judges absence is being viewed in this way because it's taking away from a playoff contender as opposed to Otani who in all likelihood, is taking away from a 500 team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad, especially for the Yankees because they were playing well. They were playing really well, and like you said, without Judge, they never play well. But at least they got Donaldson back. Man, Donaldson has been back for three games, three homers, a sick ass play yeah. last night, a sick ass play, and a play where he wasn't even paying attention. Dude was doing pitch calm and caught a ball. He's honestly his first three games have been. Pretty electric. He's just in a different place right now. He uh, he knows that it's the... I think he's smelling the roses for the first time. Like, he knows that, all right, this is the back end, uh, and I think he wants to go out with a bang. I think... I'm not saying that this is his last season, but he knows that he's not 25 anymore. Um, so, yeah, I think you're seeing a, a newly focused Josh Donaldson. He's a dad now. He knows he's a vet. Um, he knows he doesn't have to be the guy. I mean, think about those Toronto Blue Jays teams that he was on. It's like, yeah, that was Joey B uh, Batista's team, but Donaldson was the one that was winning MVPs. Um, yeah, it's it's just a different mindset for him. So I'm excited to see what kind of season he puts together now that he's healthy. But will his contributions be enough to keep the Yankees afloat <laughs> as they navigate the icy waters without without judgy. And you look at the standings right now, the Yankees are in third place. They're 10 games above 500. Very sneaky. Very sneaky 10 games above 500. And they have a better run differential now uh, than the Baltimore Orioles. They're only two, they're only two games back of the Baltimore Orioles right now. Uh, still seven and a half back in the division. Tampa is uh that they've won four straight. Um but the Orioles, the second place Orioles are now within striking distance of the uh, New York Yankees. So we'll see how that plays out. It is uh, it's something to keep an eye on as 
the American League East tries to occupy all <laughs> every single one of the wild card spots. But got to talk about Cerebral for a second because Cerebral is here for anyone who's looking for help with their mental health, no matter where you are in your journey. Cerebral helps people with anxiety, depression, stress, insomnia, and more. If you feel like you're experiencing burnout or processing a major life event, Cerebral is care that's ready for you. It's 100% online. You take a brief questionnaire. You get matched to a care team based off your needs and preferences. Through the Cerebral app, you can schedule your sessions, get your questions answered, and access additional mental health resources. Cerebral is one of the few services that provides medication management online through a licensed provider if clinically indicated. Connect with your therapist on your own schedule through your laptop or the Cerebral mobile app. Schedule sessions based on what's most convenient for you. Don't have to wait weeks to be seen. 80% of members see a provider within five days. You can do your sessions on a laptop or on a phone so you can always find an area at home where you're most comfortable. Affordable treatments that are one third of the price of traditional therapy. Treatment options are available with or without insurance. Cerebral is in network with several insurers, and they're working every day to grow their partnerships with in network. Uh, within network, your monthly cost is even lower. Cerebral understands that finding a therapist isn't a linear journey. If your therapist isn't a match, Cerebral will help you find a provider that meets your needs and our listeners right now our listeners you can receive an exclusive 50 percent off your first month of therapy by going to cerebral.com slash jared j-a-r-e-d that's cerebral.com slash jared for 50 percent off your first month of therapy for quality mental health care that's accessible and affordable join cerebral today uh joe did you come prepared today with your uh on pace segment mm -hmm. yeah i got a great crazy you, one you did oh what is Why it you sound surprised well because i mean I, I mean not that you've ever forgotten but i just feel like i've never had to remind you so i'm always just like oh there's a chance that maybe joe forgot this week i don't know that's true all right anyway <laughs> <laughs> back to the regularly scheduled event let's do a little trivia oh let's check in on how the other uh pace guys were doing Zach Neto, okay. he got hit by one pitch. <laughs> he fucking, this is just like the Zach Neto uh, on pace for HBP segment. Go ahead. He got fucked up again by pitch. So he is <laughs> he did. on pace to be the, I have the record for hit by pitches by the time he's 30. That's kind of the pace we're looking for. He's going to lead the league hopefully mm -hmm. this year. I don't want to say hopefully, yep. but. I mean, if you get hit by enough pitches, eventually you're going to get hurt. It's kind of amazing he hasn't yet. So that's another tip of the cap for Zach Neto on pace for 35, I believe. Uh, in terms of the division being the worst division ever, I don't even really know. I lost track. I forgot to look that up, but that's fine because we'll do that next week. And for the new one. This one is interesting because I don't know if you guys have been keeping up on ta your tabs with Kyle Schwarber, but he's on pace to be the worst hitter ever to hit 40 home runs. Okay. And you now, and that by what unit of measurement? By a lot of units okay. of measurement. He's on pace. Okay. First of all, Kyle Schwarber has 36 hits this year, and 42% of those hits have been homers. Okay, so, so he's I, like Joey Gallo. He's like Joey Gallo. Joey Gallo never hit 40 homers, I don't think. That's, I don't believe. I think he did. Let's look that up real quick. Then uh, he might, he's on pace. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing for Schwarber because right now he has a negative war, but is on pace for 40 plus Joey Gallo runs. hit 40 home runs twice. Okay. He had 41 in 2017. He had 40 in 2018. He had 38 in 2021. Okay, so all those seasons where he hit 40 home runs, like Schwarber's on, on pace to be a lot worse than those. Because... Yeah, because he, he at least hit 200. Schwarber's under 200, right? Yeah, Schwarber is batting once... And I did this before yesterday. Yesterday, he went one for three with the home run, which kind of... You know, helps this argument a little bit. Like all he does is hit homers and it's good and bad. But <laughs> so 
Schwarber has a negative war, but is on pace for 41 home runs. That means he is on pace to have a negative 0.7 war and still hit 40 home runs. So this is, according to this magical stat war that we all fucking rely on and love and the genius people from above and their calculators gifted us with this stat that tells us everything and it's mad it's awesome uh (laughs) kyle schwarber if you have 40 he could have 40 home runs this year and still be worse than madison bumgarner i mean a replacement player are we trying to say that it's (laughs) are we trying to say that it's like controversial because I mean, it doesn't take any time at all watching Kyle Schwarber play defense to understand how he's giving back all of this. <laughs> but Plus, he's literally, a, a, as opposed to last season, where he mostly just hit home runs, he's literally not doing anything other than an occasional home run this year. Like, his OPS is 747. It's just, it's really bad. Like, I, <clears throat> this is an interesting thing you brought up, so I had to look it up. The lowest adjusted OPS in a 40 homer season was by Tony Batista in 2000 when he posted a 102 OPS, which is basically he was a league average offensive player in spite of hitting 41 home runs. Kyle Schwarber is at 105. It would be the second worst ever. We remember that Todd Frazier season with the White Sox where he had 40 homers but was not very good. Yeah, That, That is Kyle Schwarber's season this year offensively. Like he's he's having the Todd Frazier 2016 experience, only he's a butcher in the outfield while he's doing it. Right. The plan wasn't the ideal plan was not for Kyle Schwarber to play in the outfield all the time. But when Bryce Harper is coming back in D8 and soaking up most of the DH, you don't really have a choice if you want Schwarber in the lineup. And they're they're paying him to be in the lineup. Yeah. But how I mean? How can you hit forty I mean, home runs and have a negative WAR? That's literally insane. It just fucking yeah. doesn't make yeah, any I, sense. I know it makes sense. You're gonna tell me why it makes sense. He sucks at defense. I mean, I, think <laughs> I, just, I, I feel like I just. Did I know that. it makes I feel sense. Like we dude. just did that. If that's the thing. It makes sense because he sucks at everything. But it doesn't make sense because he hit forty fucking homers and have a negative WAR. It's fucking insane. Which I don't he think is gonna doubles. happen. I mean, I think this is honestly a good sign for him. To be this bad, not bad, he's about to have an OPS plus of a 101 and still be on pace for 40 homers. I feel I, like that can only go up from there. I have I have the exact opposite take on this that you do. I think this is terrible <laughs> for Kyle Schwarber. And I think he's getting progr- I think he's getting worse and it's right in front of our eyes. Like he had a 928 OPS in 21. He dropped a hundred points from 21 to 22. So he had 46 homers last year, but dropped 100 points in OPS from the previous season, and he's dropped 80 points between last season and this season. So in two seasons, he's lost 180 points of OPS. He has to be an impact offensive player to be any good at baseball if he's going to play defense. And right now, he's not he's not impacting the game at at a high enough level offensively to warrant all the other stuff defensively that you have to deal with with Schwarber. Unfortunately, on pace for 40 homers. He hits bombs, dude. It's a shore bomb. It's shore bomb after shore bomb after shore bomb after shore bomb. He he may this is this is one of your on pace fours. I sort of I I started to glaze over during the Zach Neto treatment. The Kyle the Kyle Schwarber treatment is one I'm gonna be locked in on because he now has a real chance to be the worst, the least productive offensive player to hit 40 homers in a season all time. Yeah. That's what I've been Love saying, what a dude. Great <laughs> <laughs> he's up base. So he's batting 171. And I, the names that Jehe just brought up, for some reason, I didn't have that. I don't know why I looked this up on StatHead. So maybe I looked it up wrong and there's people missing. But from what I gathered, the lowest batting average ever to hit 40 home runs was Kyle Schwarber last year uh, with a 218. Right now he's batting 170. No, that can't be true because because uh, Gallo did it at like two oh six. Prove it. I'm looking. I'm looking it up. Yeah, so on. I fucked and messed this up a little bit. Not necessarily. Hold on. Joey Gallo has a forty one home run season where he hit two oh nine, and he has a forty home run season where he hit two oh six. Yeah the the worst the record the lowest batting average in a forty homer season is Adam Dunn in 
in 2012. What was it? Which is what? 204. Okay. So Schwarber's on pace to then, beat that. Then the, t- then the two Gallo seasons, then Schwarber season last cool. year. Now, what about RBIs in a year for a 40 homer season? In a, the yes. fewest or the... Stand by. <laughs> Just having a nerd <laughs> off right now. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> Who needs Dallas? Right. Just hit up Stathead. Uh, right. Shout out baseball reference. Uh, fewest RBI in a 40 homer season is Joey Gallo's 2017 when he had 80 RBI and Mike Trout's last year, 2022. He had 80 RBI with 40 homers last year. Uh, so 80. So Schwarber's on pace for 86. Now, another one to track. Last one hits. Yep. The fewest hits in a 40 home run season. Yes. This. This That's this he could have Gallo. a. I'm gonna guess it's 94. It is Joey Gallo's 94 in 2017, mm. then Joey Gallo's 103 in 2018, and then Adam Dunn's 110 with the White Sox back in 2012. Mm. Yeah, because that was like a whole thing back in 2017 was the percentage of hits that Gallo had that were home runs like he had 94 hits for the entire year and 41 of them were homers yeah so right now strober's on pace for 97 so he's in this in this conversation and did you say did jay hey did you say who had the fewest who had the lowest war amongst them all is that you said that earlier i have not i had not done that yet i was doing uh adjusted ops but i will do uh wins above replacement right now 44% 44% of Gallo's hits were home runs in 2017. So the worst. So there has never been a 40 homer season that produced a below replacement level year. So hmm. this would be the first. Mostly, I would guess, because they kept those players out of the field or not in the outfield. But uh, Adam Dunn uh, in 2006, when he was still with the Reds, Produced a 0.4 war season in 40 home runs. Um, and then Jeff Burroughs in 1977, father of Sean Burroughs. And then another Adam Dunn season split between the D backs and the Reds uh, in 2008. And then Chris Carter and then Dante Bichette, who has kind of gotten famous for his OPS versus war numbers now that people have gone back and realized that. A, Dante Bichette was a butcher in defensively and that the 90s Coors field numbers should be treated with a grain of salt uh, for a lot of these guys because of how crazy the offensive levels were. But yeah, I mean, this is the difference with Adam. Like, so Adam Dunn is the worst wins above replacement for a 40 home run season. Right now, Adam Dunn's OPS in that season is 110 points higher than Kyle Schwarber's current <laughs> OPS. So that's another reason why he's he's below replacement level because he's not even good offensively. I know it's hard, 40 <laughs> home runs and not good offensively. I, I'm not fully there yet either, but like he's not doing anything else. Well, thank God it's June because this guy in June is just next <laughs> next level. And dude, I was looking at the Kyle Schwarber stat. If you just took out Kyle Schwarber's June out of his career, he would not be in the league. Well, did you see the stat that I tweeted the other day? No. So since the start of 2021, he's hit 30 home runs in the month of June in 58 games. But his OPS is like only just barely over a thousand. Like I thought if you have like, you know, we talk about like June Schwarber and he hits 30 home runs in 58 games in the month of June. You're talking like a 14 something OPS. Yes. But that's just not the case. It was like it was no. like a thousand eight, which is still great. But dude, when other people go on homer runs like that or unconscious months, they they do other things. They walk. They get a few singles. They'll mix in a bunch of doubles. We might not see the highlights of those things, but those things happen. Kyle Schwarber, we don't see the highlights because those things don't happen even when he's hot. 
He just hits the homers. Um, and by the way, I keep talking about like how bad Kyle Schwarber's defense is. And I figured it would be a little unfair to keep saying that without actually providing some sort of context for it. Um, so if you use Savannah, uh, StatCast's outs above average, he's tied for the second worst defensive player in baseball this season. Only Ahmed Rosario, Manning shortstop for the Cleveland Guardians, has been worse. Um, and if you're like, oh, oh, who cares about outs above average? I don't like that stat. Well, then we'll use defensive runs saved over at Fangraphs, where he's tied for the second worst defensive player in baseball. The only one worse is uh, Ruiz on the A's, actually. Shout out. Um, so yeah, he's he's um, an atrociously... he. We solved this issue years ago. Kyle Schwarber shouldn't play defense. <laughs> and now they have been forced into a situation where they are, and we're seeing the, the depths that you can plumb uh, in terms of wins above replacement when Kyle Schwarber plays It is defense. funny how Bryce Harper getting injured was worse for Kyle Schwarber's career than Bryce Harper's career. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really bad for the Phillies, probably. Too. Terrible for the Phillies. My my fighting fills. Hmm. Well, uh, Luis Arias is not in the same boat as Kyle Schwarber. We know that. Since our the we, exact we were talking, opposite. yeah the the last episode that we did. We were like, oh, my God, did you see that Luis Arias is hitting 390? That's crazy. Like, do you think maybe there's a chance that he could hit 400? Well, guess what? Since he got to 390, he is 7 for 12. <laughs> and uh, he's 7 for 12 in three games. And he is now hitting 401. Dude, back it up. Over his last four games, he's 12 for 17. Yes. It's fucking crazy. Yeah, he, he went five for five against the A's on June 3rd. So he is 12 for his last 17. <laughs> um, five runs scored, four doubles, no triples, no homers. But he's hitting 706. <laughs> He's hitting 706 with a 1663 OPS. Pretty good. I think a guy, I think a guy finishing with a batting average in the 400s and on-base percentage in the 400s and a slugging percentage in the 400s would be like my favorite nerd stat like yes. accomplishment ever. Like that looks so sexy. I I hope <laughs> it I hope he does it. I'd be all in on a pursuit of 400. I don't know yeah. if I was clear about that when we talked about it on Monday. I want I want that to be a thing so badly. The pursuit of all 400s. He's hitting yeah, 401 or just like, with yes. a 451 OBP and a 495 slug. So he's got, I mean, the OPS is 946. You'd be like, damn, 946. <laughs> like this guy, this guy fucking must hit some tanks. No, he has one home run. <laughs> how, about a, how about a 946 OPS with one home run? Has That's incredible. Yeah, you have to. You basically have to hit 400. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of that's kind of how that works. It's like it's the it's basically the opposite of the Schwarber conversation, where you have to do everything but the home runs. Yeah. Um, and in his case, it's not the walks; it's the hits. Uh, right. He's got 15 doubles, which is like you know that's that's good. that's pretty good. But one triple, one homer, 946 OPS. I'd prefer if he ended the season with one home run. Me too. That would be nice. I I think Rod Carew, Rod Carew is the only player in baseball history to win a batting title without hitting a single home run in the season. I want to try to hold on, give me one second. I want to try to find the reverse of what we were just talking about, where a guy Hit what's the highest, what's the lowest or the highest OPS in a one home run season uh, <laughs> by a guy who played enough to qualify for the batting title? I, I get it, depending on like what year you start the search in, there's got to be 
some yeah, I'm like gonna start it. Joey Periwinkle for the 1846 Louisiana Slapdicks. He gonna, he hit fucking 392. Yeah. All right, all right. So I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start in the <laughs> wild card era just okay. to give us a sense. Okay. So excluding 2020 because that that throws out this sort of stat in a weird way. Mm-hmm. So the current mark in the wild card era for highest OPS in a one homer season by a qualified batter is 763 by Adam Eaton in 2014. So about 180 points below Luis Arias currently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard to do. Like, like it you is. said, you need to basically hit 400. I mean, Luis Arias almost has as many hits as Joey Gallo did in his uh, 2017 40 home run season. He's got 85 hits. Gallo had 94 for the whole year. Or just how about that? It's st- nice to have this that stat that's going around. He has more multi-hit games in his career than strikeouts in his career. Just as like a to step away from the stats for a second, aesthetically, it's just nice to have a player that's this extreme currently in the game because it felt like we were moving away from this broadly as a game over the last decade in like kind of the post Ichiro era. And while he's a singular talent and nobody else is doing anything like this, it makes it more special when it's a singular talent doing something like this. And I don't know, I'm all for home runs and you know, exit velocity. And I, I love all that sort of stuff, but it's also fun to watch, to watch a guy do it differently. Yeah. Is there, is it like the, uh, for you guys, both more so Jay Hay being like the ultimate stat geek it's batting average. Do anything for you? Cause I feel like, yep. okay, thank you. Because a- for absolutely. me, it's always like, if like batting average, I hate when you throw out batting average on Twitter and you've got all these like 22 year old geeks that are like batting average. Really? What are you a dinosaur? I never want to see just the batting average. I need the full right. context. Like I need to see it, what is like the OPS. What's the slug? What's the on base? What's the weighted on base average? What's the isolated power? Like I want to look at all that, but in, in conjunction with each other, but I, the only time the batting average alone matters or it's interesting to me is when you're like <clears throat> in this situation, not just, not just chasing 400 but if you're hitting like 370 then yeah like i like i i care about batting average i still care that like if a guy's hitting 300 like yeah that is a value the the people who are yelling at you about who cares about batting average are fighting a battle that already has ended like that battle was won the argument was that batting average isn't the most important stat and it shouldn't be the first stat that we talk about when talking about a player's value, like because that's for a long time, it was one of the preeminent stats in the game for measuring a player's value. And that's really what the argument was. It's wait a second. Why are we looking at that when we could be focusing a little bit more on on base percentage, which measures the entire piece of the the pie getting on base as opposed to only one method of getting on base? That's that's what the argument was. If you're a stats person, you would hopefully also appreciate the historical significance of stats and the the role that they have played throughout the game. And that's why I care about batting average. That's why I care about this pursuit of 400 that we were just talking about, because like 400 means something within the fabric of the game. Like there is no on base number that is so ingrained within the fabric of the game as 400 is as a batting average. That doesn't mean that batting average is more important than on base percentage. It just means that things can still be cool while not being the most important thing in measuring a player's value. Like I I want to know this is the highest batting average since this. This is the first guy to make a run at 400 since this. Like it matters and and by the way, like it is part about being of being a good baseball player. There are many many different ways to do that, but one of the ways to be a great baseball player is to put your bat on the ball all the time and make things happen. And aesthetically, if you were drawing up the perfect baseball player, you wouldn't draw up an Adam Dunn who hits 190 and still gets on base at a 400 clip or whatever, you would draw up a guy who hits 330 and gets on base at a 400 clip because you know what that guy also is doing? He's putting the ball in play and creating excitement. So like, 
<clears throat> I just don't have time for the like nobody's arguing that batting average is more important than on base percentage anymore. Or if they are, they are arguing it with themselves. Um, yeah. because that battle is that battle's over and we can still appreciate batting average and its role in history. Yeah, now it's kind of yeah. like the icing. It's batting average is like a nice little icing on the cake. Like if you see a yeah. guy hitting like 40 bombs and he's batting like 300, you're like, oh, that's a fucking elite. Like that's he has yeah. it all. Yeah, you want bat to mm-hmm. ball skills. Like nobody's saying you don't want to have a high batting average. You'd always rather have it be that way. But in the past, it was arguing for players who the, the Previously, it was saying a guy who hits 300 but has a 320 on base percentage is better than a guy who hits 250 but has a 410 on base percentage. That's where the disconnect used to be 25, 30 years ago. That's no longer the case. Nobody thinks that first player is better now. Um, So we can all move on. Shout out Luis Arias. We love you. Come on the pod. That'd be great. That would be great. Um... I would welcome that big time. Um, just like I would welcome any type of uh, <laughs> HBO show that comes along with Max.com. There's a new streaming service called Max is a sure bet with everything on HBO Max, including HBO, the DC Universe, Adult Swim, together with TLC, Discovery, Food Network, and more. Max really has some of the best content out there. There's literally something for everyone in your household. Max, the one to watch. Subscription required. Visit max.com to get your subscription today. If you're like me, you're trying to like get into some of these shows. It's Succession. Um, Euphoria. I'm not going to do Game of Thrones, but House of Dragon, not for me. But there's there's something for everybody. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be. No one's gonna bat a thousand. Not even Luis Arias, who's batting fucking seven eighty <laughs> over uh, over the last week or so. Um, I think that's it for me. I I did have the only other thing that I had left here was like the A's stadium deal falters in final hours of legislation session. I feel like that's not a conversation that we should have without the other guy. Yeah, we'll skip. That can be. We can revisit it tomorrow. That's fine. yeah. Let's revisit that tomorrow. We get another episode coming back at you in twenty four hours. Uh, but a loaded show today, as promised. Wednesday episodes usually aren't this meaty, but there was a there was a lot to get into today. Uh, one last thank you to Carl Ravage for making the time for coming on today. By the way, Ravi is going to be doing Sunday night baseball back to back Sundays of Red Sox Yankees. I know people are going to be pumped about that. Woo! Red Sox Yankees. Just like the old days. Uh, back-to-back weekends this Sunday, next Sunday, first at Yankee Stadium. Then the following weekend will be at Fenway Park. You can catch Ravi and the rest of the crew on Sunday Night Baseball. Thank you to him. Uh, Joey, any final thoughts? Watch out for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Pittsburgh yeah, they're, Pirates. Yeah, they're in, back in first place. Well, they're half game out, I believe, right now. That could change in about four hours. Wait, they they lost last night. They yeah, they lost to the A's last night, so that's tough. Oh my god! But you know, shit happens. The Braves yeah. lost two games to the yeah, A's. The best teams, mm-hmm. best teams lose to the A's. That's true. That is true. Um, Jay, hey, any final thoughts? Uh, just one more time. Uh, follow Sarah Langs on Twitter at s langs on sports. Um, as good of a follow as you could possibly have for baseball stats and uh, overall baseball enthusiasm. Shout out, Sarah. We love you. Um, and if you uh, if you have the resources to do so, please uh, hit up starsforsarah.org uh, or any of the other ALS ventures that are out there. Book Shambi, I know, does Project Main Street, which is also uh, a very worthwhile charity uh, if you're looking for multiple outlets as well. So those are my final thoughts. Thank you. Sweet. Um, all right. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Jake's takes. Are you there? Uh, yeah, just prayers up for Judgy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, need Judgy to be healthy because that's that the only shot that we have at taking our shot at getting Judgy on the podcast 
is if he's healthy. I don't know if if he's hurt. If he's hurt, I don't know that he's going to travel with the team. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But uh, need him healthy. Game's better when Judge is a part of it. So uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. We are...